Good afternoon, according to Central European Time, and welcome on the third session of Genealogies of Memory Conference. The session bears the title Borderland Memories in Europe, Renegotiating Holocaust Remembrance. This session aims at revisiting the reception and the memory of the Holocaust, which shifted significantly in the past decades with a special emphasis on European borderlands and different nations of Europe. This session with, with, will also focus on local, national and transnational and also global patterns of Holocaust memory. And we will also analyze interactions and interconnections between these uh, different levels. Before we start the academic discussion, let me share with you some organizational information. The session will consist of two parts. First, we will have a keynote section and then a panel with four presentations. Between the two uh, parts, we will have a 15 minutes long technical break. You are welcome to address questions to our speakers. You have different options to do that. If you follow the conference on YouTube or Facebook, please send your questions by email to the address genealogies at ENRS.eu. And if you follow us on Zoom, please send your questions via Q&A panel. We will monitor all of the questions and introduce them to our speakers. And now, it is my great pleasure to welcome here Professor Eva Kovács, who is uh, our keynote speaker today. A short biographical statement. Eva Kovács holds a PhD and the title of a professor. She is a sociologist and since October 2012, research program director at the Wiesenthal Institute for Holocaust Studies. She is also research chair at the Institute of Sociology at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. Her research fields are the history of the Holocaust in Eastern Europe, research on memory and remembrance, and Jewish identity in Hungary and Slovakia. She has authored five monographs, edited nine volumes, published numerous articles in pre-reviewed journals, as well as co-curated exhibitions in Berlin, Vienna, and Budapest, among others. She is also the founder of the audiovisual archive Voices of the 20th Century in Budapest. The title of her keynote is Forgetting by Remembering on the Europeanization of Local Memories of the Shoah. Dear Eva Kovács, it is very nice to have you here, however virtually. Uh, we are very happy uh, for this and thank you that you accepted also institutionally, like um, uh, privately as a scholar or invitation. And now uh, the floor is yours uh, to deliver your keynote speech. Dear Gabor, thank you very much for this uh, kind in introduction. And also, I would like to thank you um, for the invitation. I'm really sorry that we are online, but I, I try to do my best. So the story I will tell you this afternoon may not be a new to you. In my presentation, therefore, I will not discuss historical facts, but only the relevance to our topic. Memory studies scholars agree that with the success of globalization or Europeanization in the commemoration of genocide, some fundamental discrepancies came to the surface. The reasons for these discrepancies can be explored in numerous ways, ranging from global political hierarchies through the European crisis in recognition of victims to fundamental cultural differences within memory communities. My presentation will mainly focus on the last topic. It can also be observed en mass that the conflict in commemoration activities often originate paradoxically in the lack of local memories or a basic desire to forget the painful past. Given social fragmentations, the high levels of participation in the genocide, resistance to the dominant politics of memory is to be expected. 
At the same time, they are a great many descendants of the victims and survivors who are interested in a worthy commemora commemoration, and local civic involvement also matters politically. To illustrate this complexity of the memory landscape of genocides, I have chosen examples that are or organized around uh, and underlying memory practice, the recognition of genocide by its physical evidence and its consequences for the politics of mourning. I will argue that on the one hand, the exercise of the right to mourning is culturally determined and on the other hand, the exercise of the right to mourning uh, uh, and on the other hand, uh, uh, making the labor of mourning locally impossible, incessantly encourages those who want to mourn to be creative. Indeed, mourning with dignity is a fundamental anthropological feature of humans. And let's start uh, with the story I first read in an article of Magorzata Woshinska, and it was really inspiring in my later um, um, uh, research projects. So I will start with a quote. My guide started asking me about the Jews when we were in Butare in southern Rwanda, where I was visiting Thierry Sebanya, who had made his own private genocide, genocide museum in his flat. In 2005, Thierry, together with a group of people who has survived the genocide in Rwanda, went to Israel and visited Yad Vashem. This was when I realized, he said, that I have to tell the people in my country about it. Black and white photos, as you can also see in this uh, picture, in the slide, uh, which Thierry brought from Yad Vashem are hanging on the walls, streets on fire, people in striped clothes, documents left by the Nazis. We don't have any documents, said Thierry, only tales and stories. I also don't want to spend my life among these pictures. But ever since I found out about this, the Shoah, I can't get my mind on anything else. Quote ended. These excerpts from a report written by Konstantin Gibert, an international journalist and founder of the Polish Jewish intellectual monthly Midrash, shows the complexity of the European memory of genocide. Konstantin Gebert was one of the main protagonists of the Polish democratic opposition between 1978 and 1989. Sorry, I, 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 I hear some surrounding noises from the studio, I guess. Following the Yugoslav war, he visited several killing sites over the world and reported uh, his experiences in the media. In 2009, he also visited Rwanda. The Murambe Genocide Memorial in Butara is one of the darkest killing sites in the world, uh, rated by the dark commentator of the so-called Dark Tourism Virtual Guide at the maximum score of 10, although it is not the only one of, of its kind. In Rwanda alone, there are hundreds of official and non-official memorials. These killing sites not only belong to the grassroots commemorative practices on rituals of the locals, but also are attractive sites for global tourism. In the past few years, this narrated history of the genocide in Rwanda has become part of the global memory industry, both the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and the Visual History Archive of the USC Shoah Foundation have rich collections of personal accounts of the survivors, while Rwanda is, permanent, is a permanent theme of the annual Lemkin seminars of the State Museum of Auschwitz-Birkenau. As the private museum of Thierry Sebagamba testifies, the framing of the Rwandan genocide within the universal narrative of the Shoah clearly attests to the successful adaptation of this narrative into the remembrance of a particular genocide that happened outside of Europe. The second generation of survivors pay regular visits to Auschwitz and at the 20th anniversary of the Rwandan, Rwandan genocide, the Tutsi refugee NGO Ibuka, together with representatives of the city of Paris and the Fondation pour la mémoire de la Shoah, 
in a grid that still in the symmetry to Père Lachaise. These vectors of memory suggest that the Rwandan genocide found its appropriate place in various memory communities in Europe and the US. However, upon closer examination, some fundamental discrepancies became apparent. European museums criticize the Rwandan memory practice in which human remains form part of the memorials. This questionable status of dead bodies, whether they must be preserved as prescribed by Western techniques and ethics, or exhibited in their organic decomposition, resulted in the rejection of cooperation between the Rwandan government and the Auschwitz-Birkenau Museum in 2010. The incident would seem to be a minor blunder in comparison with the underlying similarities. If it did, if it did not call into question some essential issues, such as what constitutes material evidence of a crime. We don't have any documents, said Thierry, only tales and stories, meaning that for the people of Rwanda, dead bodies and the material remaining of the victims are not included among museum objects that represent the suffering of people in the context of a museum narration, but are, once and for all, part of the present local social reality. They must remain and decompose in situ, otherwise they would lose their essential value as evidence. Memory sites come into existence within the framework of social and political negotiations and lo uh, local, domestic, regional and global level levels. However, they often lose their physical evidence in the process of symbolization and institutional institutionalization. Moreover, since genocide is a crime committed by states, its legal recognition is always complicated and its place in the national memories often remains controversial. Yet, many of genocidal mass killings have not been recognized by the international forum. If the, there are still unburied victims, what happened then? My second example for the problematic situation of the killing sites in the memory landscape of genocides is Srebrenica. Next slide, please. As you all know, in July 1995, the Bosnian, the Bosnian Serb army in Srebrenica and its vicinity systematically slaughtered more than 8,000 Muslim men and boys in three days. The Dutch UN peacemakers stationed in Srebrenica were unable to stop the massacre. Srebrenica became a universal object of investigation even before the Parliament of Serbia approved the resolution in 2010 condemning the Srebrenica massacre. The foundation stone of the Srebrenica Genocide Memorial was laid in the presence of 15,000 family members of the victims. Since the first Memorial Day in 2002, ten, tens of thousands of people have taken part regu regularly in the commemorations. To this day, nearly 7,000 victims exhumed from the 80 mass graves have been identified. In 2010, the International Court of Justice mandated the arrest of uh, General Ratko Mladic, who was responsible for the Srebrenica massacre. He was captured and brought to justice in 2011. During the same time, the Open Society Archive in Budapest organized an exhibition, Srebrenica Exhumation. Open Society Archive's reconstruction was built on forensic reports, autopsies, military maps, site sketches and photos, satellite images, reflections of the investigators and forensic experts, testimonies by survivors, and excerpts from films. This exhibition also reconstructed the land art model of a mass grave. The memory of the massacre often was marginalized for political reason, reasons in certain parts of Europe. The sensitive issue of addressing the responsibility of the Netherlands and France was one side on the coin, its other side being that this European genocide of the 20th century was directed, directed against a group of European, Euro, Europe's Muslims. 
This created difficulties not only on the European, but also on the, also on the local and national political levels. However, in 2013, Supreme Court of the Netherlands declared that the Netherlands as a state was found responsible for the death of three of the murdered men. The court also found that it was the government of the Netherlands which had effective control over, the, over its troops. The ruling also meant that relatives of these victims of the genocide are able to pursue the government of the Netherlands for compensation. For more than 25 years, uh, the Women in Black movement, a feminist NGO in Serbia, has protested against the denial of this uh, Srebrenica genocide that is so pervasive in the Serbian public memory precisely because it remained strikingly divided regarding Srebrenica. The slogan in the mirror, Serbia sees Srebrenica, was repeated by the women in black activists in Loznica in July 2015, 16, 17, etc. They called on the Serbian government to declare July 11 a day of remembrance for the victims. In the same days, Russia vetoed a United Nations Security Council resolution that would have condemned the Srebrenica massacre as a genocide. The veto was praised by Serbian President Tomislav Nikolic. Now, turning back to the example of the exhibition in Budapest, it is not unique. On the contrary, thanks to rapidly developing technologies, the globalization of the human rights movement and the hype of dark tourism, it's fully integrated into the new forensic turn in interdisciplinary studies and memory practices. Originally, the forensic approach has its roots in Holocaust studies and represents a return from the classical document-based history to the survivor's testimonies and the material objects of Nazi crimes. As it is observable throughout Europe, the numbers of new archaeological research projects and reconstructions of former killing sites and concentration camps has multi uh, multiplied in the past decades. On the one hand, forensic studies reflect on the intercultural, multi-religious and transnational legacies of genocide, using not only the tools of archaeological methods, history writing and anthropology, but also the leftover effect of political interventions, transnational justice, the human rights movement and commemorative practices. Situated always in a specific locality, where in many cases the invisible but contaminated landscape is part of everyday forgetting, searching for dead bodies can generate formative changes in local remembrance practices. Moreover, problematizing the dignity of these human remains as demanding a proper burial, the right for mourning, the emotional understanding of crime, all these questions touch the fundamental ethical issues of the human conditions. On the other hand, precisely because of the, their intercultural orientation and political embedment, forensic approaches also are subjugated to the political instrumentalization of that and the assertion of cultural or religious sensi sensitivity, as we have already seen in the Rwanda case. Under conditions of permanent uncertainties, the search for, for unburied victims and hidden mass graves provides decade-long missions, not only for amateur locals, but also for professional archaeologists, inspiring art and literatures as well, literature as well. The best known example is Yahad in Unum, an almost fanatic mission of a French Catholic priest, Father Patrick Deboa. For the past two decades, Deboa has been turning, uh, touring killing sites by killing sites and conducting fieldwork researches relying on witnesses' account. The project, Holocaust by Bullets, aims to identify and record each site of mass executions of Jews, Roma and other victims by the Einsatzgruppen in the invaded part of the Soviet Union to make sure that their traces do not disappear from the earth and that they can be respectfully memorialized. Prominent Holocaust and forensic institutions from all over the world support Deboa in his researches. However, forensic missions also can shake up things in local communities that are interested in forgetting the past, 
not to mention the well-known Polish examples because of our time limit. My last case shows the complexity of local forgetting and transnational remembering. When launching my first research project on cross-border uh, identity in Rechnitz, located in South Burgenland at the Hungarian border, at the beginning of a new millennium in the year 2000, my Austrian colleagues told me not to ask people about this, the so-called scandal of the mass grave, because if I asked them, they wouldn't tell me anything about their lives. Mass graves, what happened in Rechnitz? From the fall of 1944 on, thousands of forced laborers were, were working in the vicinity of the town. They were commanded to build the so-called judo wall that, were, that was supposed to stop the Soviet tanks. In spring 1945, a new group of, of forced laborers arrived in the Death March from Hungary. On March 24, 1945, Following the party held, by SA, party held by SS and SA officers, the leaders of the local administration, and among others, Count and Countess Batyani, the, the uh, latter, uh, latter was a Tyson sister, who hosted the party in their castle. These drunken guests killed 180 first laborers in an old horse town called Kreuzstadl. We murdered they murdered another 11 people already on the road leading to the Kreuzstadl, and in addition, 18 men were killed on the following day after they had buried the victims of the massacre from the previous day. When the war ended, the doctor of a neighboring village filed an accusation against an unknown perpetrator. While the legal procedure was unfolding, the evidence of the massacre somehow disappeared, and under political pressure, the eyewitnesses didn't testify against the accused. Furthermore, in 1946, two of the witnesses were secretly murdered in the wake of a pub fight <coughs> in the town. Although legal procedures lasted unusually long, the last trial ended in 1962, the perpetrators were weren't found. In the early 1990s, Unknown culprits, perhaps young members of the Freedom Party, severely damaged the Jewish cemetery, the last relic of Jewish culture in Rechnitz. In 1993 and 1996, the Wiesenthal Center revived the case and initiated an expedition to find the mass grave without success. The la uh, latest unsuccessful search expedition took place in October 2017, uh, this is the picture you can also see in my slide. Uh, again, forensic experts are preparing a new excavation near the town. So never ending story. First, I went to Rechnitz in the end of the 1990s, so it's a history already, and started to conduct life history interviews with the 80, 90 year old locals. After presenting his life, my first interlocutor, Mr. H, showed me a couple of photographs. The black and white photos that were probably produced by a talented or even by a professional photographer portrayed Jewish genre pictures of Rechnitz, for example, excursions, swimming, walks, picnics, etc. On the back side of these photos uh, um, were names and dates with explanatory notes. As the interviewee said, the pictures showed members of the local Jewish community. So this is the local Jewish community, not the forced laborers. When I asked him how he came to have these photos, he answered that he had got them from Mr. K before 1938, that is, just before the Jews left uh, the town. The notes were produced by Mr. A.G.'s son, in the 1980s, who showed them to his friends from Canada. Mr. A. just explained to me further, I quote, the Jews of Burdenland were luckily because they could emigrate. They were transported to the Yugoslav border and then English ships took them across the Adriatic Sea. The Brown family and other families too, who had been hiding in Yugoslavia, returned to Rechnitz. 
No, nobody had any difficulties. But I say all Jews were lucky because they could go away. Hitler came on the 12th of March with, uh, with the whole army and the first, the first Jews left on the 8th of April, then on the, on the, uh, on the 12th and the 20th and the 21st and uh, first the whole community. One of them lives in America. Well, he's still alive. Our neighbors, you see, they also emigrated with their son to America. Good end. My second interviewee show me, showed me the same pictures. He told me he had got them from Mr. S before the departure of the Jews. I became more and more frightened by these comments, especially when I saw the same pictures and listened to the same stories the third time in yet another house. Ironically, I found a similar photograph from Rechnitz on the website of the Washington Holocaust Museum. Next slide, please. Uh, in fact, the Jews of Rechnitz never appeared in the life histories of the interviewees. They began to mention the Jews only after finishing their own personal narratives. In terms of both their soci uh, sociolinguistic and structural forms, the two narratives, the biographical and the thematic ones, were entirely different. While the life stories broke down in a natural and log logical way at par particular points of the narration, the stories of the Jews of Rechnitz were extremely coherent, almost perfect. They must have represented a common local knowledge of this topic. This common narrative portrays a peaceful coexistence between Jews and non-Jews in Rechnitz and ignores the Shoah or, if it doesn't, it stresses the survival of the Burgenland Jews by the way of gross exaggeration. To understand the meaning of these photos, we have to combine the micro and the macro stories with historical, political and socio-psychological interpretations. First, we have to exclude the option that the town as a whole wanted to save the culprits of the 1945 massacre and therefore constructed and illustrated narrative of peaceful coexistence between Jews and non-Jews of Rechnitz. However, there can be only a few current inhabitants who stayed in Rechnitz at the, say, at the time of the massacre. Most of the men were on the front and anyway, most are not alive today. It's also, like, uh, it's like, it, it's also likely that nobody from the Jewish community gave his or her family photos to my interviewees freely. It's well known from historical research in Austria that virtually nobody helped the Jews when they had to flee. The Jewish community, which amounted to 20% of the population in Rechnitz, one of the largest in Transdanubia, left Rechnitz for Croatia and Hungary in a single week. The photos were found probably by the locals in an empty house afterwards. And even if my interlocutors told me the truth, somebody made copies and distributed them among his and or her friends many decades later. But why did that happen? Let us compare the pictures with the comments. My interlocutors were convinced that Rechnitz was a unique town at the border of Austria and Hungary. They told me the following with pride, I will quote. Well, Rechnitz was always unique in all of Europe. Always, always, three religions, the Protestant, the Catholic and the Jewish, and three nationalities, the German, the Croatian and the Hungarian, lived together. And now, now this is also not a problem for us. At school, I used to learn all three languages. I, re I read not only Goethe, but also the Hungarian poets such as Petrofi. And as the Catholic school, they were not only Catholic children enrolled, but also we, the Protestants, and many Jewish children as well. There was no problem, nothing, never. I must say, there was no difference between us. The pictures served to depict this unproblematic coexistence with happy Jews and to reflect an atmosphere of trust in which they were handed over to my interviewees by their Jewish, Jewish neighbors at the very last moment of their life in Rechnitz. But looking at the pictures, one sees no non-Jews appear in them. The illustrated idyllic memory is probably only a cover story for the real one, I believe, 
It helped them to ignore the story of the massacre seven years later. In 1938, the older men, uh, my, my interview partners, were 15, 20 years old, who per perhaps observed the expulsion of the Jews from Rechnitz passively and shortly after started serving in the Wehrmacht or in the SS. On a deeper psychological level, the story may be covered up their guilty feelings about their role in World War II. None of the Jews returned to Rechnitz after 1945. In local parlance, they crossed the border, moved or emigrated in 1938, and nobody asks why they didn't come back after the war. Similarly, they are not interested in whether or not their Jewish neighbors died in the Shoah, even if they were not deported to the concentration camp directly from uh, Rechnitz, but later from another Croatian or Hungarian town. Nobody talks about these issues openly. On the contrary, the town maintains a historical continuity, however fictive and absurd it may be, with the help of these cover stories and photos. As long as the Jews lived here, we liked them. Since they have not lived with us, we preserve their memory. The example of Rechnitz is not unique in Austria or Europe. Local communities tend to have difficulties in remembering their own Jewish victims. Replacing the terms of expansion and deportation with that of free emigration is also well known on, in our continent among the forms of soft denial of the Shoah or other genocides. Normally, however, this way of reckoning with the past doesn't produce a local master narrative contributing to collective identity. In Rechnitz, the master narrative has three elements. First, the experience of peaceful coexistence before 1938. Second, the proximity of the state border. Thus, the expulsion of the Jews also meant a simple crossing of the border. And third, last but not least, the massacre in 1945, in, in which, as is well known from court procedures, the citizens of Rechnitz regarded the forced laborers uh, as strangers, foreign Jews who came from Hungary. They didn't consider the liquidation of the starving people and their agony as comparable to what they thought to be the fate of their own Jews. While the local community has remained silent about the mass grave until now, in 1987, a small group of outsiders started commemorating the massacre, which led to the founding of the so-called Refugees Association. Nevertheless, this didn't change the attitudes of the locals. As a matter of fact, the master narrative overpowered the new initiative. What has happened to the memory of the Jews in Rechnitz during the past 30 years? In 1991, a memorial stone was unveiled in the Castle Park dedicated to, not only to the almost 200 Hungarian Jewish victims of the massacre, but also to four of the town resistance fighter, fighters. Four. However, everybody forgot about the expelled local Jewish citizens in the ceremony. Shortly after, in 1992, the founders of refugees declared in the constitution of the association that, in addition to remembering the Nazi period, they would also focus on the refugees of the Balkan war. Don't forget Srebrenica. In 1994, the association donated the Burmanland Federation of Jewish Communities, the Kreuzstadl, the building where the massacre took place. Both institutions declared that this memorial was dedicated for all victims, all victims of the Südostwald. While Rechnitz remained silent and the eyewitnesses slowly began to die off, the programs of the refugees became more and more international. Survivors from all over Europe, public figures and politicians from Hungary and local politicians from Burgenland come together every year in the Kreuzstadl and remember the victims of the Todesmarsch while the local victims fade away from this scene. Parallel to this, in the mid-1990s, two pieces of art emerged out of, Recht of the Rechnitz scandal, a film and a stage play. The film focused on the search for the corpses, while the play tried to reconstruct the day of the massacre. However, 
The artistic methods of coming to terms with the past didn't bring about significant change in the attitudes of the locals. A decade later, in her play Rechnit, the exterminating angel, Nobel Prize winning Austrian novelist Elfriede Jelinek enacted a kind of linguistic excavation uh, in the creator of memory. Next slide, please. This is the Rechnitz, uh, um, the exterminating angel, angel. She showed as a Buñuel exterminate, as, as in Buñuel's exterminate, exterminating angel, the film, how a small dinner party had become a calculatedly uncontrolled crime. During the past decade, the Rechnitz massacre has been interpreted in many ways. Even Sasha Batyani, born in 1973, the cousin of Margit Batyani, published his research findings in a docufiction in 2016 with the title A Crime in the Family, and two new films were also produced, a documentary with the title Arpad and Geza, and a movie directed by Amichai Greenberg, The Testament. However, these artistic methods of coming to terms with the past didn't result in a significant change in the attitudes of the locals. So to sum up, in the first part of the case reconstruction of Rechnitz, I discussed the ways in which the local Jews as victims of sur or survivors disappeared or played a minor role in the daily practice of memory politics and the everyday life in the locals. In the second part, I analyzed the processes of creative forgetting or forgetting by remembering. The gap in, left in collective memory by the expert and murdered Rechnitz Jews were filled first by the tragedy of foreign Hungarian Jewish forced laborers coming from Hungary until both were diluted in the European memory of the Shoah. Although the events of commemoration take place on this spot, they have less and less in common with the history of the given place. When I wrote my first article about Rechnitz, I didn't think at all that in two decades I would have new ammunition to continue the story. However, as new attempts are made to process the Rechnitz massacre from time to time, I have gone back and forth to look at what has changed since I was last there. More recently, it was a cross-border bilateral, bilateral Hungarian-Austrian conference that brought me there a year ago. The speakers were pretty much the same, relatives of the victims, archivists, historians, sociologists, anthropologists, refugees, representatives, forensic ex experts. So we are the locals now. With the audience, uh, uh, while the audience was younger and younger. Probably the interest will not ebb until the mass, grave, mass graves are found. Is that interest not in, a way, in vain? Maybe not, because during the rep uh, repeated search, Cultural products are created, and in an uh, ideal case, these products themselves promote mourning, which is a kind of search itself. Thank you very much for your attention. Dear Eva, thank you very much for this wonderful and inspiring lecture. I'm convinced that we will have a lot of questions from uh, our audience. Just. We have to give them a little more time. In the meantime, I will try to reflect briefly on your keynote lecture. You offered us a wide overview of various memory landscapes and local communities, including Rwanda, Srebrenica, and Rechnitz. And this overview and your comparative approach cast light on fundamental differences between these communities regarding social practices of how to deal with material evidence of the genocide or how to work through the mourning process. And what uh, first came to my mind listening to your lecture is the fact that you uh, use the word forgetting instead of the word oblivion, for example. While uh, the word oblivion would refer to a permanent state, forgetting is uh, more of a process or an action. And in this sense, I think 
Forgetting is also a work which is closely related to remembrance. So my first question would be, could you highlight uh, the mechanisms of forgetting and say a few words, uh, what kind of dimensions forgetting might have? I also have a second question. Um, I will give you a whole group of questions and you can just answer all of them or just pick up some of them as you wish. So the second question, uh, you mentioned in your keynote lecture that uh, forgetting is not unique in Austria, it's not unique in Europe. Uh, so I'm interested in, uh, in your opinion, how common and widespread is uh, this kind of memory construction in Europe, forgetting by remembering. Does this construction of uh, remembrance work in other European communities as well? or not. I think this is also an important aspect uh, from a perspective of the upcoming panel presentations, which will bring into the surface different local and national experiences. And uh, I have a third question, which is a little bit uh, the inverse of my question. Uh, so the first one, how the Reichnitz experience can go global. And we have the inverse question from uh, Zuzanna Dobzhanska, who is a sociologist uh, interested in human rights and social exclusion. And her question is, how is global tourism impacting on local commemoration of particular events, especially such strong ones as genocides? I think this is the first group of questions. And now the floor is yours again. Thank you very much. All of these three questions are, are very ex so very good, excellent questions. I tried I tried to to give a, a concise answer because discussing uh, oblivion and forgetting uh, it's rather a methodological question. What want what what I want to understand? Uh, if I want to understand the structural um, uh, conditions of the society then I would use the word uh, oblivion because it describes long durée uh, uh, specific, specificities of a society or, or of, of collective remembering or forgetting. Or on the other hand, if I am on a field work and I want to understand how social actors uh, take part in a, in a commemoration event, or how, they, how, how memory, uh, local memory, organizes the everyday life, I would prefer to use um, remembering and forgetting as a, as a rather active uh, categories, which can also not only describe uh, the, uh, the progress within a community, but also make it, makes it able to analyze step by step what is happening uh, from the very beginning of a commemoration act up to the end of it. So who are the agents? What kind of it is possible in this, in this commemoration? And if you, if you take my, my, my example of Rechnitz, then you will see that it was an encapsulated, a totally encapsulated story uh, within the community. And, uh, uh, the agency uh, was produced from outside. Uh, Wiesenthal Center, don't forget, I, I didn't have enough time to tell the whole story. It was a survivor, so a uh, 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 family member of a victim who wanted to, to start to, to the excavations. Uh, so somebody from outside, but still a very involved person who started this, this fieldwork. Uh, on the other hand, uh, in this region, in Burgenland, um, the public intellectuals uh, wanted to uh, um, yeah, deal with this past. And uh, as I mentioned, they, they, they used the forms of uh, cultural um, 
the, the cultural activities like theater performance, uh, 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 document of, uh, uh, a documentary, or uh, organizing an NGO who, who start to uh, bring back the, the story of the Hungarian uh, Jewish forced laborers into the fall. Uh, on the other hand, because they weren't member of the of the community, they didn't know about the the, the Jewish uh, locals of Rechnitz. So it, they have a very special task to to find the the mass graves, or to to find the mass graves and remember on the Hungarian Jewish forced laborers, and they did not know anything about the the Jewish locals who were expelled in 1938. So this is what I wanted to stress that uh, uh, locals, if locals encapsulated uh, this history uh, from outside, it's not, it's, it's, it's extremely, extremely hard to to uh, reproduce this totality which the local, which the locals, which the locals have in in uh, in uh, commemoration or in in reproducing collective identity. Uh, the second question is uh, whether it is a speci uh, specific uh, um, mood of forgetting by uh, replacing. <laughs> Uh, I don't think so. So if you if you, if you look around, they, they will, you will have uh, many other examples in Poland, in in former Soviet Union, in Hungary, uh, where where um, uh, locals uh, try to forget uh, uh, the victims of the Shoah or replace this position of the victims with another group of victims. In Eastern Europe, uh, the classical uh, model is replacing the victims of the Shoah with the victims of the um, communist uh, uh, terror. So it's a very typical way of replacing uh, the victims. Uh, it means also that they are... Uh, so, they, so this way of thinking uh, produces a kind of a comparative victimhood. And in this comparison, uh, a group of the uh, um, one, uh, a group of the victims will be also uh, uh, removed or replaced in, uh, with another group of the victims. And to the sec to the third question, I don't know whether I answered your question. The third question is uh, how global tourism uh, influ influences the the local remembrance. Uh, I think I partly answered. This question with my first answer that uh, if this global, not just tourism, cultural encounters, may I say cultural encounters, not just tourism, because, because we are also tourists in a certain way as anthropologists working there. So uh, cultural encounters um, can be can, can be formative in certain ways, like uh, like uh, the action of Dubois, Dubois, as I, as I mentioned, so he 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 travelled through the whole Soviet Union uh, and work, worked months long with locals and tried to recognize the places, the histories, the family stories, etc. And of course, they are now killing sites, uh, which you can also visit as a tourist. Uh, so I, I'm not sure whether we, we we can define the borders between tourism and uh, cultural exchange, and I don't want to do it. Thank you very much <clears throat> for your answers, and now I would like to continue our uh, discussion. Um, Considering the missing, missing corpses uh, in the Rechnitz case, which seems to me that uh, they form the missing corpses, form the basis of the master narrative of the local community there. And um, 
in this context, we have two questions, both of them uh, from Małgorzata Woszyńska, who is an independent researcher, and she's also one of the conveners of this conference. Uh, I will try to read these questions. Uh, they might be a little bit complicated, so I will read them uh, very slowly. If we consider psychoanalytically that mourning is a kind of symbolical process, cross-cultural process, enabling post-traumatic integration of I, individual or collective I, and in Reichnick's case, the uh, process of mourning is uncertain at the most fundamental, local, grassroots, environmental level, what can we recognize as a fundament or motiv motivation of post-traumatic integration of the local population. So, once again, motivation of post-traumatic integration of the local population. This is the, the core of this question, I think. And the second one, uh, in the context of the master narrative, what kind of emotions you are discovering in the local population's master narrative. It seems that the narration works quite well. It is integrated. But does it really help him with the pot potential of healing? You mentioned that the verbal narration of your witnesses on their, on their private past life autobiography was spontaneous, vivid, natural, while the narration about the past of Rechnitz was structurized, somehow established uh, from above. You also mentioned um, uh, something similar in your answer. So the question is, which emotions uh, could be an engine for this creative forgetting, or, uh, or rather creative remembering? Shame, fear, or something else? And I would add, uh, hypothetical question as well. Uh, what do you think if material evidence would be discovered in Reichnitz, what kind of impact it could have on the master narrative and the memory practices of the local community in Reichnitz? This is the second group of questions for you. Thank you very much. Very, very, uh, yeah, very, very good questions. So, um, I will start again with the last one. Um, material evidence is uh, still extremely important because we have um, family relatives of uh, former victims, uh, of victims and survivors. So don't forget the fact that uh, they are family, me family members there in this whole uh, story or memory game, you can see fanatic, fanatic uh, sons and grandsons and granddaughters of victims or of survivors who want to know uh, where are the uh, graves. So this is the first very important point. The second, uh, yes, of course, material evidence uh, uh, if we, if, we, if 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 the next excavation will find will fi find the, the the mass graves, I think it will be it will really change the discourse because it will be a kind of uh, peaceful end of this long run. Uh, on the other hand, um, I think this whole commemoration um, process uh, reached there peak with uh, with the with the um, uh, theater uh, theater performance of uh, of um, Fida Jelinek because on this level it was widespread uh, in the whole world a Nobel Prize uh, winner um, writer wrote a uh, theater um, uh, performance I think it was enough so you cannot read reach a higher level of commemoration. Uh, but on the other hand, it also um, mean that it also means that uh, uh, it 
yeah, it reads also the, its limits for the locus. For the locus, it, it doesn't play a role that Afrita Jelinek uh, uh, wrote a theater performance. Or on the contrary, it's really bad uh, because then Rechnitz, uh, their town, uh, has, has a, a, a very, very bad context again. And this contextualization is the, more, the most traumatic uh, uh, episode of this long story. And that this is, a, uh, a, 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 I'm going to the second, the second uh, question uh, about emotions. I don't think so that uh, shame and fear uh, plays a, a fundamental role now. I think it's more important uh, the feeling of irritation. So why even our or town uh, is so important in the context of uh, of Second World War or, or the Shoah. Uh, many other villages had uh, similar dark stories. Why even our town will be um, thematized in newspapers, in, in, in theater performances, etc. So it's rather not a shame, it's a kind of irritation. Uh, but what I felt when I was there, uh, shame was not shame, shame was not present thirty years ago uh, or twenty years ago. I also remember that uh, I I I met many old men who were proud that they were part of the the Third Reich as Germans. So. These, lo these local, these local uh, differences are, are rather unattractive, I have to say. So it's, it's not uh, or, or were unattractive 20 years ago. Now these old uh, men are uh, uh, not there anymore. But uh, when I conducted these interviews, this feeling of being uh, part of a, a bigger um, Mm, a big uh, uh, Reich was was really important for some of them. Uh, so shame, fear. I I I didn't I didn't turn that uh, during my my field work. And okay, what is the motivation? That was the third question. Uh, I don't remember what was the question. Gabor, can you help me? It was this long, it was yeah, this really, was really this. long, long question of Mark Boise, yeah? Yeah, it was a very long and a little bit complicated question uh, of Mark Boise. the I, the psychological. Uh -huh, the yes, psychological. the individual and collective I. I can uh, read for you once again this question. Uh, so, if we consider psychoanalytically that mourning is a kind of symbolical process enabling post-traumatic integration of I, individual mm -hmm. and collective I, and in Reichnitz's case, process of mourning is uncertain on the, on the basic level, on the local environmental mm -hmm. level. Uh, so, what can we recognize as a fundament motivation of post-traumatic integration of the local uh, population? So yes. it's a little bit just to just to um, add maybe an, another point to this question. I think it's it's closely linked to the to the question whether it is possible to do uh, real mourning work without the material dimension of uh, of the trauma. Uh, don't forget, don't forget the photos, and don't forget, don't forget the the horses. I didn't mention the houses because I don't didn't have enough time to to tell all of the details. But don't forget, it is a, it is a small town uh, where the Jews were expelled, but the houses of the two Jewish families are still there. Uh, I think the photos were were found in these houses. Sorry, can you? Can you do something with these echoes? I listened to my word. No? Okay. So they have a lot of material evidences. 
uh, not oh, no so the mass graves so don't don't forget this is really a complicated story but don't forget the mass graves are the graves of hung, uh, Hungarian Jewish forced laborers uh, they, they, they came from Hungary they were not part of the local uh, local uh, community they were that just Jews or just Hungarians or just slaves so it's, it was a distance it was not our story on the other hand and like we didn't discuss it yet uh, it's also uh, really good for the Hungarians uh, having a killing site outside of Hungary so this is a this is a memorial site a killing site of Hungarian Jewish suffering but it's not in our country and I think this is why Rechnitz was so successful and this is why Rechnitz could integrate many I and we identity because it was so tricky um, locally so it, it had a it had a mass grave nobody found this mass grave but it had a story about uh, the Hungarian Jewish forced laborers and you can remember as a Hungarian as a, as a Jewish and an Israeli and as an Austrian representatives but it's not your place it's it's anywhere it's not it's not in Hungary and I think it's also important that uh, uh, even so, so whether the the Rechnit uh, locals they, they must not identify themselves with this mass grave because don't remember it was Batyani, the family of Batyani, uh, the family uh, of uh, um, Count Batyani. Uh, so locals um, 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 didn't have a real connection to to the noble families of of this place. So a kind of social difference is also there. So it's not our story. We were there. They they were these uh, these uh, count and countess, and they they were responsible for the mass killings. So they were there are many ways to to. Um, as to, uh, <laughs> to to, to iso isolate isolate yourself as a local as a as a community as an eye from the um, um, massacre, and I think this is why why this Rechnitz memorial is so successful in quotation notes because it's 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 European it's global it's Hungarian but not really Hungarian it's Austrian but not really Austrian so you can you can play this with this uh, uh, uncertainty the uncertainty is not not a problem for this case but even this is the advantage of this case that you can you you have the possibility to to keep your position uh, um, as flexible as possible. It yeah, was thanks. understandable. Yes, very much. I thought about, uh, I followed the same train of thought uh, a little bit and uh, I was thinking uh, about these mass graves which are uncertain and uh, through this uncertainty they might uh, belong more to uh, a kind of transnational or global, maybe symbolic, maybe virtual uh, level, uh, and be disconnected in the same time to this uh, local environment, and uh, and this is, I think, very interesting. In the meantime, uh, we have another question from Zofia Vujicka. Uh, she works in the German Historical Institute Warsaw and I quote her and uh, her question thank you for the interesting lecture Roma Sandika and her colleagues from the Jagellonian University coined the term non sites of memory for sites of murder or genocide that were not officially commemorated but remembered by local communities in some way, even if only by conscious neglect. 
was Rechnitz, Rechnitz uh, is such a non-site of memory? Uh, this is the this is the question. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. In in the paper I wrote about Rechnitz, I used the word non-lieu, uh, and it's the same. So non-lieu uh, means that it's a place uh, without any um, contextualization, historical contextualization, local relevance, etc. Yes, in 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 in, the, in this very certain way, uh, Rechnitz is a non-lieu. Uh, as many other places uh, in Central Europe uh, where a kind of commemoration practice was established or the so-called Jewish cultural um, tours or guided tours, etc., without having a local um, uh, life uh, uh, of uh, Jewish uh, um, neighbors. Uh, yes, we have a lot of uh, non lieu in Central Europe, and I think we have also many non uh, uh, uh thinking about uh, uh, our socialist past, because we also have many um, uh, places and memory sites which are uh, actually inactive or or uh, re-established as uh, as as another so as a new place of uh, of memory. Although we know, we, have, we know that they were also places of other commemorations in the past 70 years or 50 years. Thank you very much. We have still five minutes, I guess. So uh, I would like to ask a final question, uh, moving towards a little bit uh, Holocaust studies as a discipline and uh, deal with current challenges in this uh, field. Recently, we observed the uh, forensic turn in Holocaust studies. And my question is, what is at stake while providing material evidence of the mass killings? Why, we, why would it be worthwhile, if at all, to continue the seek for the material evidence and continue the excavations? Is it important for the historical knowledge that can be uh, uh, served with uh, that, that can be gained by uh, new material evidence, or it is important for the second and third generation relatives who can, um, who can now, could make the morning uh, work, uh, or it is important uh, to force the local communities to review their master narratives, or it is important to return to locality in order to redefine and re-establish national, transnational and uh, global narratives and uh, practices. So once again, uh, what is at stake? Why it is important uh, to, to find more and more material evidences of the mass killings? Uh, that would be my last question. And uh, you have still three and a half minutes to answer that. Gabor, you have already answered your question because they are the main important components uh, or the main important uh, aspect of... I, know, uh, I just wanted to hear your opinion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is not my topic, I have to say, so I am not a forensic expert. Uh, as I see, uh, there are different schools in this field and what I, I found really important, as I mentioned also in my lecture, uh, working to, together with, with locals. Because if you are there, you should work together with the locals. And if you are working with the locals, you cannot confront, conf just confront them with the historical past, but you also have to find a way to, to uh, proper, uh, uh, proper, um, uh, historical representations of this local community or the or the former um, generations of these local com communities. So it's a kind of uh, participative research. And if you are conducting a participative research, that is not a, a po it is it's politics uh, to do something together with the locals to make them um, sensibilized uh, for questions. Uh, using documents in, in proper way or asking documents, family documents, objects uh, in the house, 
etc. We have good examples. You are also a Hungarian as me. Um, in Papo, a couple of years ago, it was an excellent exhibition uh, on, the, on the Jewish community in Papo. Uh, almost 100% uh, destroyed community. Uh, and uh, when the curator started to, to um, build the exhibition, the local community started to visit him with objects they found in the house, in, the, in, the, in their houses, and asked him, what can they do with these objects, with these letters, with these photos, etc.? How can they put it into the picture? And it is the third generation, without any shame or big shame or fear or, or guilty feelings. So they are, I think, more and more open-minded to collaborate this type of researches. Not just uh, uh, killing sites, but uh, yes, the last uh, traces of Jewish communities in Europe. And I think this is a new generation and, uh, and I am really optimistic uh, um, um, following, the, following the new dev developments in Central Europe. Where, where many many communities try to reinvent or recollect their past, and I hope, uh, and I, I want to say it, it to Sophia, that I hope that will not will it will not uh, uh, be a non uh, a non place, but rather uh, uh, a, a place of uh, of collective identity or local identities. Thank you very much again. Uh, I have to confess that uh, there was a strong motivation to move towards the, the forensic turn and ask your opinion about uh, this topic uh, because we will have a whole session uh, devoted to this uh, forensic turn, 18th of uh, November, and uh, the title will be Forensic Environments of the Holocaust and its Memory. So I think that uh, our discussion can serve as a basis for further discussions uh, uh, in the upcoming sessions. So now uh, I would like to thank you for this wonderful keynote lecture and uh, the whole inspiring discussion. Uh, I think we learned a lot. Uh, thank you very much for this. And uh, now this is time to uh, have a 15 minutes long break. Uh, we will come back in 15 minutes. Thank you very much for your attention. I also, t also want to thank you, uh, the questions and comments and this, uh, this wonderful moderation. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Good afternoon. Here we are again. Welcome on the third session of Genealogies of Memory Conference, Borderland Memories in Europe, Renegotiating Holocaust Remembrance. And after the keynote lecture of Professor Eva Kovac, we continue our session with four presentations. Our first presenter today is Naum Trajanowski. Hello, Naum. Uh, just Hello. a short biographical statement. Naum Trajanowski is a PhD candidate in sociology at the Institute of Philosophy and Sociology of the Polish Academy of Sciences. His PhD project deals with the local memories of the 1963 Skopje earthquake and the post-earthquake reconstruction. He holds MA degrees in South Eastern European Studies and Nationalism, nationalism Studies. Uh, Naum was affiliated with the European Network Remembrance and Solidarity as a project co-coordinator, the International Research Network Courage Connecting Collections as an advisor and a proofreader, and the Faculty of Philosophy, Skopje as a researcher. His uh, recent work on the memory regimes in North Macedonia was published as a peer-reviewed paper in Brill's South Eastern Europe, while his take on the Macedonian post-Yugoslav memory culture was published as a monograph, I think recently, a few months ago, by the Macedonian publishing house Templum. The title of his presentation is The Holocaust and the Rescue of Macedonian Jews, Communist and Post-Communist Cinematic Perspectives. Hello, Naum, and now the floor is yours. Hi, hello. Can I see the presentation? Okay, just in the meantime, uh, thanks, Gabor, for, for the introduction, and thanks for having me here. Uh, this indeed, uh, this research is part of the of my interest at the cultural memory of the Holocaust in North Macedonia, which I was actually starting. Which I I, I'm hearing from the panelists that they cannot hear me, but let me just. I hear you now. I think everything must be fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. I will try to be more loud in a way and I increase the volume to the maximum. Okay. Thanks again and I'll try to speed up things. So practically this is part of my, uh, let's say, uh, site research interest in the cultural memory of the Holocaust, which actually started with uh, my, my uh, research on the Macedonian uh, memory politics in the course of the last two, three decades. So without further ado, I will start with the paper as I have a pretty long paper for today and I believe I will be able to call, to cover all the uh, the case studies of films I, I chose for today. Uh, so practically it was Darko Mitrevsky, the director of uh, the third half, who stressed that every generation of filmmakers should produce films about the Holocaust in 2012 on the occasion of the in one of the initial screenings of the film in the US. However, this statement can be read only as a wishful anticipation. Coming from the Macedonian cinematic milieu, Mit, uh, Mitreski was well informed that there was there are just a handful of domestic films dealing with the Holocaust and the tragic fate of the Macedonian Jews in the wartime years. Even so, as rightly pointed out by Nadesh Ragaru, the portrayal of anti-Jewish persecutions has not remained taboo throughout uh, the socialist era Eastern Europe. It took the Macedonian workers, uh, film workers approximately 25 years to showcase the Jewish, Jewish suffering during the Second World War as a TV film and more than 40 years as a feature film. Uh, this development should be certainly read in the immediate, uh, read in the immediate uh, Southeastern European and subsequently Yugoslav context. Uh, so, as noted by Nevena Djakovic, only several other feature films de dealing with the Holocaust were pre produced in Yugoslavia from 1945 up until 1992. Uh, I will be reading the, the English names of all the films I will be mentioning. So, Him uh, Himmel Commando, 1956, by Boschkovic and Nikolic, Five Minutes of Paradise, uh, 1959, Igor Pretnar as a director, The Ninth Circle, uh, Franz Stiglitz, 1960s, and Blackbirds, uh, Blackbirds and the Fed One, 1967 and 1970. 
So in this paper, I, I argue that a closer look at the public debates over the few Macedonian feature films dealing with the March 1943 uh, uh, event, events uh, or the period of the roundups and the deportations of the Macedonian Jews is neatly illustrating the prevailing socio-political consensus and the key discursive shifts on the Holocaust and the deportations of the Macedonian Jews in Macedonia. By employing multimodal discourse analysis, I will predominantly focus on the public receptions of the films within the Yugoslav and the Macedonian public domains. And for these purposes, I was analyzing materials, namely press clippings, interviews, other production-related materials at the, at the Cinematheca uh, of, of, of North Macedonia and the Macedonian Cinema Information Center uh, concerning mostly the films in the research focus. Uh, so to better situate the discursive shifts, I will first pre present a historical context uh, and an interpretative framework which uh, has the rescue of the Macedonian Jews during the war time uh, years as critical juncture. And then I will proceed with situating the four Macedonian films within the interpretative framework. Let me just switch the slide. Okay. Uh, so the Axis powers attack on Yugoslavia took place on 6th of April 1941, and the unconditional surrender of the Royal Yugoslav Army was signed on 17th of April 1941. The Bulgarian army invaded the Vardar Ban Banat and a portion of eastern Serbia on 19 April 1941. The first Yugoslavia's administrative unit of Vardar Banat, which translates into the territory of today's North Macedonia, was further divided between the Bulgarian, German, and Italian command. In result, the multi-ethnic and multi-confessional population of the most economically underdeveloped region of the interwar kingdom of, of Yugoslavia, afterwards uh, uh, named, uh, experienced a radically new political reality as of mid-April 1941. In the major part of Pardar Macedonia, the locals, facilitated by the already initiated pro-Bulgarian action committees, saluted the Bulgarian troops as liberators from the Serbian rule. But soon after the establishment of the B Bulgarian rule, this political sentiment gradually changed due to the rigorous cultural and identity policy which aimed at integrating the local Slavic population into the Bulgarian ethne. The local resistance marshaled in the, initial, in, the, in, the, in the initial period by the Communist Party of Yugoslavia would eventually culminate in the for formation of the Communist Party of Macedonia in 1943, and the mass support for the cause promoted by Tito's partisans in the last two years of the Second World War. Uh, the Macedonian Jews, alongside the Macedonian Roma and Turks, were in an even worse position than the ethnic Macedonians. So even though the decrease restricting the rights of the Jews were already introduced by the first Yugoslav Svetkovic Maček government in 90, uh, uh, 1940, Having fallen under Bulgarian jurisdiction, the community of more than 7,700 Macedonian Jews became subject to a new set of anti-Semitic and raci ra racist laws. On 22nd of February 1943, Theodor Deneker, the Reich Central Security Office representative in Bulgaria, and Alexander Belev, the Bulgarian wartime minister of interior and national health, signed an agreement to deport 20,000 Jews from the new Bulgarian territories of Thrace and Macedonia with no reference to the Jews from the old territories of, of Bulgaria proper. Uh, this, the arrests were monitored by the designated members of the Regional Commissariat for Jewish Affairs and led by the Bulgarian police and the Bulgarian army. So the Macedonian Jews from Bitola, Skopje, Shtip and the smaller, smaller Jewish settlements were detained on the night of, night of 10th and 11th of March and deported to Treblinka, the Treblinka extermination camp in Trill railway transports from 22nd to 29th of March 1943. Given that these transportations were implemented swiftly with no advanced warning, uh, as put uh, uh, in one of, uh, of the Yad Vashem's de depictions, the Jewish uh, victims had minimal opportunities to escape and find a safe place, contrary to the Jews from Bulgaria proper, who managed to escape the Holocaust due to the reactions by a group of politicians and the Orthodox Christian religious authorities. So in the end, uh, 7,144 uh, 7, Macedonian Jews ended up in Treblinka, uh, which is almost the whole, practically, uh, Macedonian Jewish community. Uh, so briefly, the, the, the framework I, I'm, I'm offering here. Uh, 
in 1957 a book titled the crimes of the fascist occupants and their collaborators against the against jews in yugoslavia edited by zdenko Lovental, presented the results of the late 1940s state-sponsored research on the wartime crimes against the yugoslav jury uh, the 30 pages study touched upon the Macedonian Jews' history during the Second World War only en passant, as a five page account of the political background of the period from the occupation to the detainment of all the Macedonian Jews. So, as observed by Holy Case, uh, the failure to, man to, to acknowledge the involvement of the Macedonian Jews in the Yugoslav People's Liberation War gave a strong impetus and set the tone of the initial Macedonian historiography of the Holocaust. So short, shortly afterwards, in 1958, the Macedonian med medievalist and former partisan fighter Alexander Matkovsky published a lengthy article uh, titled The Tragedy of the Jews from Macedonia, which was further on published even by the Yad Vashem's uh, yearbook. Uh, uh, practically up until the uh, 1980s, uh, the reasons for this history, uh, as, as, as rightly pointed by Stefan Treps, with Mat Matkovsky's publication, the chapter of the Holocaust was open and at the same time closed again in the Macedonian historiography. The reasons for this negligence prior to the uh, 1980s are differing, namely Ragaru ascribes the vacuum of historical research to the absence of the Macedonian Jewish voices in the wake of the, of the Holocaust, uh, well, Treps points out the det det deterioration of the Yugoslav-Israeli and the Yugoslav-Bulgarian relations in the 1960s, while, while Jovan uh, Chuliberg stresses the link to the Yugoslav context of production of historical knowledge. Uh, and here, of course, the complice is the, uh, the, the founding myth of Second Yugoslavia, uh, the Brotherhood, brotherhood and, and, and Unity ones, uh, which uh, uh, the post-war Yugoslav historiography uh, practically overlooked at the ethnic, uh, inter-ethnic wartime cleavages in order not to harm the, the post-war multi-ethnic state building project. Um, so the history of the narratives of the Jewish rescue present, present an interesting view of the history of the Holocaust interpretations in post-war Macedonia. Uh, the first narratives practically ascribe the rescue agency to the Communist Party of Yugoslavia and the Communist Party of Macedonia, thus establishing uh, the liberation war as a dominant historiograph historiographic framework of interpreting the, the wartime rescue of the Jews in, in, in Macedonia. And this, 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 this agency of the Communist Party of Macedonia uh, was practically developed further by, by the former members of the, of the Macedonian uh, partisan fighters and, 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 and veteran organizations. And here worth mentioning is the, the set of three conferences which took place in Skopje uh, and the, the, which practically culminated in three volume publications, Skopje in the People's Liberation War. Uh, and uh, at the conference, additional passivity to the Jewish community was ascribed. To the, that's why these, these conferences are important. Uh, what happened in the meantime, uh, was practically the first set of reactions to this dominant and prevailing narrative. And just briefly, I will mention here the, the key, the key shift, and then I will, I will, I will uh, continue with the films. Namely, uh, in uh, in the, uh, as of the late 1980s, uh, the first Jewish biographies and autobiographies biographies, uh, were published in Macedonia with uh, with Jenny Lebel's chapter on on the rescue of the Macedonian Jews from the Hertaiden wreck uh, as a clear counterpoint to these rescue narratives promoted by the, by the, the veteran organizations and, and kind of uh, uh, the ones which established the official memory of the war. Um, the second one here is of course uh, Jamila Kolomona's uh, 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 work. Uh, and she also, uh, 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 as a former partisan, uh, um, fighter, also even so praising the partisan struggle, uh, sheds light on the complexity in the cooperation between the Jewish communities and, uh, and the Macedonian wartime resistance. What happened in the meantime, just briefly, in the 1990s, after the Yugoslav dissolution, a group of predominantly Jewish stakeholders advanced the idea of a Holocaust museum in Skopje, which will eventually be opened in 2011 as a Holocaust memorial center for the Jews of Macedonia in Skopje. Uh, in the very core of the former Jewish uh, Jewish Jewish quarters of, of in Skopje, uh, 
the permanent exhibition re-established in uh, uh, 2019 contains the majority of musical efforts to redefine the Macedonian Jewish history in the 1990s and uh, provides a critical step forward towards the implementing a more co coherent and objective narrative over uh, over the, the, the Macedonian wartime experience. Uh, this, of course, the, the exhibition, uh, uh, as, as I point out in the paper, uh, is, is kind of an entry point to a, a new, uh, new discussion on the, on, the, on the Jewish rescues during the wartime years. Uh, and here, of course, uh, a book chapter by Todor Chepkaganov, one of the leading Macedonian historians on the Second World War, uh, is, is, a, is a good uh, example, as he called for a general reconsideration of the, of the partisans' uh, role in the rescue of the Macedonian Jews only in 2019. The first movie here, uh, let me just change the slides. Okay, so the first movie is The Shot, uh, which rec recreates the 1942 assassination of Emanuel Mane Machkov, an infamous head of the Bulgarian police in wartime Skopje and a pre war labor leader. So, thus familiar with the faces of the majority of, of the, the, the partisan affiliates. Uh, by a Skopje uh, 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 youth, uh, youth group, partisan youth group, a maneuver which allowed the partisan troops to relocate beyond beyond the city in the highlands in the highlands lands of Western Macedonia. Uh, the film was widely promoted as one of the two major events of the 30th anniversary of the People's Liber Liberation War. The second one being another wartime film, namely the Macedonian part of the Hell, uh, 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 1971 by Vatroslav Mimi, the, 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 uh, the crowd director. And also the, the shot will be finished only uh, with a one year delay in 1972. Both the films were based on screenplays by two prominent Macedonian post authors and public intellectuals, namely Dimitar Solev and Slatko Janevski, and directed by, by well-known film directors, Gapo and, and Vatroslav Mimita, who shot actually the Fed one just, just a year earlier. Uh, Gapo uh, was in his prime when, when directing the shot, uh, announced the film as part of, of, of his tetralo tetralogy on the Macedonian 20th century. Uh, and the, the, these two films, alongside Kirill Tsenevsky's Black Seat from 1971, are co considered to be trigger films for the Macedonian New Wave, the so called Macedonian New Wave. Uh, the film gained momentum uh, during the commemorative year of of 1971 and unsurprisingly was massively attended in the last months of 1972, uh, but it received mixed receptions. So practically the Yugoslav critics were praising it in general and the Macedonian one uh, were not as excited, claiming that uh, uh, the film fails to deliver a clear message and, and provide some sort of com confusing objectivity. So here two contextual aspects should be revoked. The film came after the so-called Croat Spring of the late 1960s, which was followed by a conservative backlash within the Communist Party of Yugoslavia and the end of the so-called Macedonian liberalization period, a, de a decade-long rule of the more liberal wing within the Communist Party, which had decentralization as a, as, as a, as a, as a certain agenda. Uh, so practically the, this period ends up with the reinstallation of the former communist elite in Macedonia, and this elite practically uses the, the, the initial a post-war memory of the of the People's Liberation War as a mean to kind of re-legitimize their rule, and practically a shot is 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 is, is given in this in, is, is 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 having its premiere in this moment, and even so, without a single intention to deconstruct the common under, understanding of the People's Liberation War from the early 70s, got evaluated as a film which is not as clear in its in its delivery as the films shot in 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 the previous. Uh, time period. Uh, so, uh, just as an illustration for this, an episode from the actual assassination of, Man, of Mane Machkov, as well as the optics over its, uh, it's, it's, in, it's illustrative, as the youngest of the, uh, the assassinators, Franco Kukant, is uh, was a Jew, uh, and this ethnic affiliation is barely mentioned in the film. And Fritzkan's family, moreover, as remembered by Kocho Bitoliano, one of the, uh, the leaders of the group of assassinators, uh, was active supporting, uh, uh, act act actively supporting them. Another aspect which is also not covered in the film at, uh, at all. 
so the, the, the film uh, depictions clearly mirrored the discourse on the People's Liberation War developed at the three uh, Skopje-based conferences during the 70s. Uh, and in a way, this also recreates the atmosphere which the Jewish authors I mentioned before were reacting to practically uh, with their, with their uh, takes. Uh, the second film, Yes. Uh, so the second film called The Note came in a radically different context. After Tito's death in 1980, the Yugoslav film industry started revisiting one of the major post-war Yugoslav taboos, namely the 1948 Tito-Stalin split and the Goliotok labor camp for political prisoners. This effort culminated in the so-called Goliotok literature from the early 1980s and several, several film projects released in the mid 1980s, namely Balkan Spy, When Father Was Away on Business by Kushturica and Happy New Year, uh, 98, 1949. All of them uh, problematizing the Yugoslav mythology over the Soviet Yugoslav quarrel and shedding light to the political persecutions. Uh, the notes action takes place in March, 1943 uh, in, 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 the, in the milieu of the partisans' attempts to flee to Western Macedonia, so again, the, the same trope as, as hinted in, in the previous movie, and the deportations of the Macedonian Jews, and also follows the story of a doctor who gets into a love triangle, an illegal operation of a partisan fighter, and a desperate attempt, of course, to stop the deportations. Again, the film was announced, announced as, as a highlight of the 40th anniversary of ASNOM, the acronym for the proto-government established by the Macedonian partisans by the end of the war, while, while the media was building up the atmosphere before the screening as, as the film which will save uh, uh, the Macedonian cinema. This, of course, is in the context of the, of the financial problems Vardar, Vardar film uh, had uh, at, at that point of time. Uh, but Tsenevsky, the film director, had slightly different in intentions with this film. He rejected the epaulets of a savior, uh, and by recognizing the didacticism in the Yugoslav uh, World War, uh, Second World War themed films, in line with the side guys, practically he, he quotes uh, uh, Fassbinder, Wenders, Schlendorf as his inspirations, sought to articulate a different discourse on the wartime experience. So in other words, he uh, aspired to go beyond the traditional narrative on, on the war, focusing on the trans-historical aspects of the fascist occupation, and the wartime struggles, and he found practically a perfect base for this quest in the in the 1944 uh, novel Two Marias by Slav, uh, which uh, in a way was uh, by by the Macedonian critics portrayed as a moral psychological reflection of the occupation and the war. Uh, so the film dropped the lyrical narrative of the novel and dwelt upon its its dramatic structure in a pretty neo noir police drama manner. And, and more important, importantly, as it was noted by, by Slobodan Petrovic uh, uh, after the film screening, uh, re re revisited in a way the Jewish deportations, uh, which were the key dramatic moment in the novel, but not in the film. Uh, so the People's Liberation War here reappeared as an inter interpretative framework. In the words of the director, Tsenevsky himself, only five to six out of 35 and thir or 36 Macedonian films deal with the, with the war, an insufficient number of this key event in the Macedonian national history. Yet he stressed that his take on the war is in line, in line with the brutal poetics as, uh, of, the, of his er earlier deeds. This is his depiction of his work. While his approach as such was also also recognizes a cer certain turn from the spectacle-based film depictions of the People's Liberation War in Yugoslavia to a more intimate one uh, in the mid-1980s with the end of the war by, by, by Dragan Kresa as, a, as another example in this regard. Uh, so the film in general, I will skip this part, received negative treatment. What's interesting to be uh, to be mentioned is that the only positive revelation from uh, of the film came by uh, came by a Croat a critic, Dubravko Stoisavljevic, and pub in, it was published in the Croat magazine studio Zagreb, and he practically stressed that the film's recreation of the Jewish deportation is, 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 the, is the major takeaway, and thus the film is actually uh, 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 positive, positively evaluated because it's, it recreates this, this particular event. 
so Stoy uh, Savlevich saw this event as crucial for the narrative and sought to situate it within the historical context. And I quote here, Bulgarians kept their Jews but betrayed the Macedonian ones to the Germans. And this Bulgarian makeup is being exposed in the film. Uh, he was on the right track practically here as the film makes a clear reference to these events. For instance, the, at the beginning of the action, a friendly conversation reveals the spect spectator that the Bulgarians are uh, quote, uh, saving their Jews in order to get a fake batch of humanity in front of the world, end of the quote. Well, just moments before the deportation, a German officer asks his Bulgarian co colleague if their help is needed, and he receives, of course, a negative answer. Uh, in the, the this is of course in the context of the of the deportations. Uh, so practically, what Stoyanovich Stoyanovich missed to see is the narrative beyond the factual one. And here, Tenevsky's transhistorical approach has the historical timeline as a setting for the actual actual underlying underlying drama, namely the deportation of his own non-Jewish son with the Jews. Uh, uh, in addition, the dramatic action is dictated by the story of the partisan maneuver. So the same German officer gets angry only when he finds out about this operation. Even so, the conversation is being held at the, the Jewish detention center in Skopje. And only then the film leaves some, some room for contemplating over the history of the Jewish suffering. And I believe I will have time for the third movie at least. And I'm, yes. Uh, so, namely, this is the third half. Uh, uh, um, uh, this, came, so this came after a series of interviews uh, 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 by, by the formerly uh, in, entitled Shoah Visual History Foundation. The Shoah Foundation in the, in the late 1990s uh, with the, 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 the Macedonian Jews. And practically this, this initiative uh, 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 and this, uh, this team got picked up uh, from, from this point in, in, in the Macedonian cinema. Uh, anew, and it was in the late uh, 2000s when one of the leading Macedonian post-Yugoslav film directors, Darko Mitrevski, uh, announced that he will adopt the story of Neta Cohen, a Skopje-born Jew who managed to escape the deportation by hiding in her non-Jewish boyfriend's house as a feature film for, sponsored by the Macedonian government. He also publicized that uh, he came across the story when research, researching for his documentary serial on the history of Skopje, uh, Dossier Skopje, uh, uh, is the title and the interviews with the team members of the wartime FC uh, football club Macedonia. Cohen's boyfriend and further on husband was one of the players of the club. Uh, and while the team held a history of being a wartime center of resistance, uh, with the historiography of oftentimes depicting the, the, the stadium as the only and the first liberated territory in occupied Skopje, uh, the Football matches were also uh, escalating in, in physical confrontations between the spect spectators and, and the police, which is also a team recreated in the in the first movie, The Shot. Uh, third half gained uh, publicity even before the official film trailer, as three Bulgarian uh, members of the European Parliament issued a letter to Stefan Fula, uh, the erstwhile commissioner for enlargement and European uh, uh, neighborhood, stressing that the Macedonian film is twisting the historical truth and calling for a halt of the Macedonian EU integration. In turn, Mitrovsky gave num numerous, numerous statements for both the Macedonian and Bulgarian media, claiming that his film is a love story and referred to the as, as, as frequently uh, stressed, the Spielberg project for, for the historical accuracy. Uh, also, in this regard, the film premiered in Skopje in 2013 after the screening of the Schwarz Foundation interview with, with Neta Cohen. So the final product was a historical epic, an amalgamation of the pre-war love story of a Sephardi Jewish girl, which was roughly based on Cohen's testimonies, and an ethnic Macedonian artisan, the wartime history of the football club Macedonia and the city of Skopje. It was the most expensive Macedonian film in the history, and it was the only Macedonian entry for the 85th uh, Academy Awards. And many observers have heretofore claimed that the film is one of the epitomes of the nationalist turn in the Macedonian cultural production and cinema, especially associated by and large with the 10-year rule of the rightist political camp. The Holocaust, or more precisely the cosmopolitan memory of the Holocaust, was instrumentalized to tell the the ethno-Macedonian struggle, to retell the story of the ethno-Macedonian struggle during the most turbulent period of the 20th century history. Um, here, just briefly, as I'm looking at the time, I will mention that um, 
the, the, practically the, the idea is that the football club Macedonia, a clear reference to the contested state name in the peak of the Greco-Macedonian dispute, uh, dispute, wins matches in the Bulgarian leagues of, in the football leagues of the occupational regimes, uh, a context which allows a single reading of the Bulgarian treatment of the Macedonian Jewish uh, uh, Jews practically as a treatment of the Macedonian citizens in, in, in general, uh, which is a discursive strategy uh, defined as metonymy by, by Johan Kulibrek. Uh, and moreover, Cherry picks the wartime history of the actual FT Macedonia. Uh, so from a cinematic aspect, it's also interesting to know that the third half belonged to a recent group of films in the post-Yugoslav space, which rely on the sportive events and especially the memory of these events. Uh, one can actually see here Bielogrlic series of, on Montevideo, there, there are others as well. Uh, and most of the scholars have categorized the film in these regards as one of the populist, uh, this is a quote, sports films, uh, which play with nostalgic tones and hold a clear commercial ag agenda. Uh, but interestingly enough, uh, Third Half subverts this uh, sportive pattern in a rather interesting manner. Its narrative structure resembles the Soviet cinematic commonplace, namely the sportive victory over the oppressor, with the dead game, uh, the infamous actually dead game, which took place in the occupied Kiev in August 1942 uh, as an inspiration for for several film projects afterwards. So even so, building upon this trope, the Macedonian third half avoids these ide ideological traps and practically de-ideologize the whole, the whole setting. Uh, an example here is the main character who, for instance, claims that his motivation for joining the partisan struggle as a private one, so he's in love with the Jewish lady and not, not, not an ideological one. And I believe I will stop here and I, 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 I believe I will have time to to, to maybe uh, say some of the, the, the concluding remarks at the end and even mention the final film I had prepared for today. Yes, thank you very much now for this uh, presentation and for drawing up this trajectory, how the Holocaust memory was developed in Macedonia in the context of uh, filmmaking. Uh, regarding the length of, the, of your presentation, is it was also a second keynote speech almost. Uh, so this is high time now to move to the second presenter, who is Anna Hebaterova. She is a research fellow at the School of Humanities and Social Sciences, Sciences University of St. Gallen, Switzerland, and the coordinator of the initiative titled Ukrainian Regionalism, a research platform. She is a PhD candidate at the Graduate School for Social Research, Warsaw, Poland, and affiliated with the Center for Urban History and in East Central Europe, Lviv, Ukraine. The title of her presentation is Holocaust Memory and Antisemitic Attitudes in Contemporary Ukraine. Anna, the floor is yours. Start. Uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this fascinating conference. And uh, my presentation will mostly focus on the uh, results of sociological survey and on, um, on mass societal attitudes towards these, these complicated questions that we discussed during this conference. And uh, to start, I'd like to just draw a very brief sketch on, on of the field of uh, memorial culture in Ukraine after the collapse of uh, communism and uh, what place does Holocaust memory uh, occupy in it. So, um, as we know, one of the most drastic outcomes of World War II for contemporary Ukraine was its transformation into the land of dismembered multi-ethnicity. Uh, the Holocaust has sharply diminished the Jewish population of uh, this region and uh, nationalist ethnic cleansing policies, repressions and deportations raised most of its uh, Polish uh, but also German, uh, Tatar, Greek communities. Therefore, the history and legacy of vanished others uh, it became a very um, important but also very contested uh, page of Ukrainian history and up until nowadays it is often perceived as dissonant for the uh, construction of contemporary local and national narratives. And uh, up until today Ukrainian society remains uh, quite diverse uh, in terms of different uh, ethnic groups that live here. Uh, however, 
its Jewish community never recovered from from the huge loss of the Holocaust and also post-war uh, migration waves. Uh, nevertheless, as many uh, other surveys show, the the level of anti-Semitism in Ukrainian society up until today uh, remains rather high, uh, and uh, and therefore is 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 a an important problem uh, that's worth discussing in terms of the identity building of a new state. Uh, the interpretation of recent past occupies a prominent place of the political agenda, and uh, history often serves as a legitimizer of present issues, and therefore is highly politicized. And this is particularly true when it comes uh, to a recent uh, tragic events in the history of Ukraine. Uh, I mean, of course, the annexation of Crimea and the war in Donbass, when memory becomes one of the crucial factors of uh, ontological insecurity, as uh, Yelena Svodic has uh, rightly pointed in her recent book, and uh, is often weaponized uh, in terms of information war and uh, regarded in security terms, uh, first and foremost. Um, in my in my presentation, I, would, I will focus on the main research question, which is how the transformation of historical memory influences the perception of the Holocaust and more broadly the attitudes towards post-Soviet Ukraine. And um, my first hypothesis uh, uh, is that of the Holocaust as a rejected memory, because uh, very often the uh, memory field of Ukraine is regarded uh, as the the battlefield, let's say, of two uh, competing meta uh, narratives of Ukrainian history. Which, one which is uh, can be described as neo-Soviet and uh, is um, has its locus mostly on the, the the Soviet period and the the common pages of uh, Ukrainian history with Russia, uh, and another one as a more Ukrainian-centered, uh, focused first and foremost on the nation building and uh, on the struggle for independence of Ukraine. And uh, as many scholars point out, neither of these two competing modes, which of course do not describe the, the memory field uh, in full terms, but rather present two extremes, but uh, neither of these uh, meta is including, uh, inclusive towards the remembrance of the Holocaust. And the second hypothesis will be the competitive victimhood, victimhood hypothesis uh, when uh, we would see whether the focus of uh, on Ukrainian victimhood is linked to the tendency to undermine Jewish suffering and uh, to the increasing social distance towards Jews. Uh, okay, sorry, I cannot... Somehow I cannot, oh yeah, okay, now it works. Uh, so um, I will analyze the methodology uh, that I'll focus on is the, the survey uh, which was conducted in frames of the project that uh, was uh, mentioned before, Regeneration and Beyond Interdisciplinary and uh, Intercultural Reconceptualization of Ukraine. This was the series of, of surveys conducted in 2013, 15 and 17. And some of the main findings uh, of our project uh, can be um, read in the book that is on this slide, which was published on by CU Press uh, last year. And uh, this was a very interdisciplinary project focusing on the issues of identity, uh, language, economy, history and memory, and also attitudes to current situation. Therefore, it uh, allows us to regard uh, this question in a complex manner. And of course, as any methodology, uh, the survey has its pros and cons. So uh, on the one hand, uh, while studying such uh, complicated issues as Holocaust memory or as anti-Semitic attitudes, uh, it doesn't necessarily help us reaching to the deeper levels uh, of uh, consciousness. However, uh, at the same time, the, 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 the pro of such methodology is that it can help us disclose the, the larger views of the society and uh, of different uh, groups, uh, different communities of memory, reaching far beyond uh, certain predefined social circles. Um, and okay, yes, and uh, this. So one of the biggest. Um, blog survey was the questions on historical memories and identities uh, and uh, here I will just introduce uh, key variables that will be the the basis of my analysis and conclusion so uh, the first um, 
question concerned the uh, importance of different events in the history of Ukraine. Uh, this was a pre-given list and uh, as we can see, like three most important uh, events uh, were uh, emphasized the World War II and the independence of Ukraine in 1991. Uh, however, if we, if we look on the Holocaust, it is also uh, considered as uh, rather important, so 3.98 on the scale between 1 to 5. And uh, what is uh, even more important is the very low non-response rate. So actually only 2% of students uh, said that they have never heard of it. Uh, whereas uh, when it comes to other events in, in this list, often this, this, this percentage was uh, much higher. And uh, the memory of the Holocaust, uh, so the, the consideration of the Holocaust as an important event in Ukrainian history correlates positively with education, age, and uh, the size of settlements. So the older generation, the more educated people, and uh, the, the ones who live in bigger cities tend to estimate the importance of Holocaust in Ukrainian history higher than the others. Uh, the, next, uh, the next variable that I'd like to briefly introduce to you is uh, that of perceived guilt and victimhood. So, of course, the debates around the history of Holocaust in Ukraine bring to the surface the very, ch the very challenging questions of uh, Ukrainian collaboration and participation in mass killing of, of Jews and uh, Poles. And since the collapse of the Soviet Union, these uh, complex issues were discussed in academic circles, but uh, they did not form a part of broad public discussions. And uh, moreover, the, the issue of uh, Ukrainian nationalist uh, movement during the World War II and their responsibility in the killing of civilians has again been one of the most uh, instrumental, instrumentalized issues uh, in the context of current conflict. Therefore, uh, such debates are again regarded very much in security terms. And um, the question that is present on this slide uh, was formulated to, 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 to look at upon the perceived guilt and victimhood in relations between Ukrainians and other nations. So we've asked uh, to what extent in the course of history uh, Ukrainians were victims or acted as perpetrators towards uh, these groups. As you can see, we have, we have here Germans, Poles, Turks, Tatars, Jews, Russians, Roma people, Romanians and Hungarians. Uh, so one of the predictable results is that the integrated index of perceived victimhood of Ukrainians is much higher than that of perceived guilt. So 3.22 versus uh, 2.0. And this holds true uh, for all the nations in this list. Uh, Germans are still seen as the main perpetrators followed by Russians. But uh, when it comes to Jews, so actually uh, around 18% of Ukrainians think that Jews harmed Ukrainians. However, only 14% uh, think that Jews suffered from Ukrainians. And again, in this case, we see the correlation with uh, education and with size of settlement, just like in uh, the previous question. And the third variable that uh, is um, the index of social distance. So, in fact, when I talk about antisemitism in this case, um, this is a very complex term which can be, of course, um, regarded and measured by uh, different scales. And uh, in this case, we are talking ma mainly about uh, the social distance towards various groups. And uh, it's a basic indicator of ethnic distance in sociology. In, in this case, we used a modified Bogarda scale. Uh, when asking people to which extent they would be accepting uh, various groups as family members, friends, neighbors, colleagues, inhabitants of Ukraine, tourists, or banned from entering Ukraine altogether. Uh, as we can see, uh, among many various groups uh, in, this, in this index, the Jews are somewhere in the middle, and uh, the, the index of distance towards Jews is uh, 4.27. Uh, the majority of Ukrainians would be ready to accept them as either tourists or uh, inhabitants of Ukraine. And the, the share of openly anti-Semitic attitudes, uh, so banning from entering Ukraine, is 4.8%. Uh, and uh, as our and many other surveys show, uh, we see a very strong correlation with general index of tolerance as well as with education. 
And uh, interestingly enough, uh, religiosity uh, in this case becomes a very important factor. So actually, the more religious pe people are, regardless of their confession, the less likely they are to accept Jews in their close uh, social circle, which of course opens the question about the strengths of traditional anti-Semitism in, in Eastern Europe and in Ukrainian society in particular. So these are uh, some key variables and uh, now I'd like to jump to the main findings of, uh, of my analysis. So when we analyzed the, the importance of various events in Ukrainian history, we've actually um, conducted co a factor analysis and we've discovered that indeed uh, there, is a, there is a presence of two strong factors. One, uh, the, uh, there is a, a strong correlation between, between variables that represent uh, the narrative of Ukrainian independence struggle, such as uh, the, uh, the the insurgent army uh, so on in the party during the World War II or uh, independence in 1991 or Euromaidan and Mazep uprising. And on the other hand, the, there is the tendency of um, the factor of Soviet or uh, supranational entities history. So uh, the, the people who emphasize the importance of Soviet period or Russian Empire or also other uh, big uh, big states that Ukraine was part of, such as Austro-Hungarian Empire or Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. But in fact, the biggest and the most uniting factor, as we've discovered, is the history of suffering. And uh, this factor encompasses uh, such events as Holodomor, World War II, uh, the war in Crimea and Donbas, and also Holocaust and Volin tragedy, uh, as well as the deportation of Crimean Tatars. So, uh, when it comes to the demographic profile of the groups behind these three factors, uh, in the first case we see mostly mid and older generations uh, with higher education, uh, bilingual people, so those who speak both Ukrainian and Russian. Uh, in the second case, these are mostly younger, uh, educated Ukrainian speakers, uh, also uh, a rather religious ones and um, inhabitants of mid-sized cities and villages. And in the third, in the third factor, these are mostly the uh, older generation Russian speakers, inhabitants of big cities that, uh, that um, actually uh, mostly were found or thrived during the Russian imperial time and Soviet times. Uh, and these are mostly non-religious uh, people. So in this case, uh, we can see that the, the strongest and the most re uh, regionally diverse factors in, is the first one. So not only it appears to be more inclusive towards the, the memory of uh, minorities, but also it's, it appears to be the most uniting when it comes to regional memories in Ukrainian society. Uh, okay, and now, sorry, yeah, okay. So uh, now I'd like to address the issue of the relations between various uh, modes of remembrance and the social distance to Jews. What are the main findings of our analysis? Uh, when it comes to the first factor of uh, history of suffering, uh, we see that uh, it correlates negatively with social distance to Jews. So actually, uh, it um, predefines the, the inclusiveness of, uh, of respondents uh, towards, uh, towards Jewish people and also towards other minorities. However, in this case, the respondents are less likely to see Jews as either victims or, uh, or as perpetrators towards Ukrainians. The second factor uh, predefines uh, the larger social distance to Jews. So actually, uh, the, the people who, the respondents for whom the factor of independence struggle is more important are less likely to accept Jews in their, uh, in their close circles. And they are most, more likely to see Jews as perpetrators and less likely as victims of Ukrainians. Uh, the third factor correlates negatively with social distance to Jews. And uh, in this case, the respondents are more likely to emphasize the historical guilt of Ukrainians towards Jews. Um, and when it comes to competitive victimhood hypothesis, we've uh, discovered, we've explored it through the question of um, the uh, Holodomor uh, or famine as, as a central tragedy uh, of Ukrainian narrative today. And uh, there is a growing uh, 
acceptance of the genocide narrative that Holodomor was a genocide against the Ukrainian nation. And in this case, the respondents who see Holodomor as genocide against the Ukrainian nation, in fact, they are also were more likely to, uh, to estimate the importance of the Holocaust higher. Uh, however, they are more socially distant to Jews. Uh, interestingly, they are less likely to see Jews as perpetrators, but much more likely to deny any historical guilt of Ukrainians. And last but not least, we can see that the higher in estimated importance of the Holocaust in Ukrainian history actually becomes one of the key factors uh, when it comes to more positive attitudes to Jews. So um, to jump to conclusion, uh, I'd like to emphasize that um, in the case of Ukraine, which experienced a lot of tra traumatic events uh, during the 20th century and uh, where the uh, multiple ethnic groups um, uh, experienced violence and victimhood, uh, the disputes and concentration on memory and history of trauma becomes one of the uh, focal points. And ethnocentricity and strong national locus of memory is usually responsible for strong in-group favoritism and out-group derogation. Uh, acute attentiveness to the martyrdom of Ukrainians does not ex exclude the recognition of Jewish or other group suffering, but becomes an obstacle to openly discussing our own group's responsibility. Therefore, Holocaust memory is partially included into the history of collective traumas, but only up until the point when it becomes a threat to nas national identity or to a positive moral self-appraisal. So on the one hand, we see this traumatic narrative as a uniting one, but on the other hand, it, it, it kind of stops uh, when the question of, um, of uh, complexity of inter-ethnic relations begin. And awareness and education about the Holocaust uh, and its most challenging aspects becomes a key factor in um, reducing social distance to Jews and uh, growing acceptance towards uh, various groups. Therefore, uh, it, it, it is important to, to emphasize and to work on the, the Holocaust education in the country. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer your questions afterwards. I hope I didn't exceed my time. No, you fully respected the time limits. Thank you very much for this presentation and for this Ukrainian uh, case study. And uh, from Ukraine, now we move towards the borderlands of Austria. The third presentation will be delivered by two scholars, Nadja Dangelmeier and Daniel Vutti. Nadja is a postdoctoral assistant at the University of Klagenfurt Institute for Educational Science. She is involved in school projects and teacher training schemes on contemporary history topics and historical narratives. Her main areas of work are diversity conscious education, historical political education, and cultures of remembrance. <clears throat> Daniel Vutti is a researcher at the Institute for Multilingualism and Transcultural Education of the University College of Teacher Education in Carinthia, Austria. He holds a PhD in social psychology and is a media and communication researcher. His main areas of work are transcultural education and multilingualism, cultures of remembrance, bilingualism and multilingualism, as well as majority and minority situations. The title of uh, the presentation of Nadia and Daniel is Remembrance Culture in Border Regions Towards an Inclusive Cross-Border Memory. Yeah, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me very well and see also. I will take over the first part of the presentation and my colleague Nadia will um, start then for the second half. Remembrance culture in border regions, Spominska kulture v obmenem of mochiu. You may maybe wonder about the bilingual title of our research project, but most of you, I guess, will assign the language immediately. It's of course Slovene, and uh, we are speaking about the border region about, around or between Austria and Slovenia. Our presentation deals actually with the question of establishing an inclusive remembrance to which different inhabitants of our border regions between Austria and Slovenia on both 
regions on both uh, sides of the today's border can connect. In school projects led by us in Austria and Slovenia, the historical narratives on the border region were examined. Narratives with inclusive and unifying effects were filtered. Through the exchange between teachers, pupils and researchers in workshops, didactic materials were created. The focus was on how the history of the border region could be committed in an interesting way in the classroom, considering the diversity of the pupils. The southernmost province of Austria, as you can hear, see here on the map, is called Corinthian English, Kärnten in German, Koroschka in Slovenian. And it's the region where we are researching and teaching. It's, of course, on the border to today's Slovenia. This year, 2020, is a special year with regard concerning the border because the border was drawn exactly 100 years ago, in 1920, after a democratic referendum. After the end of the First World War, there was a dispute about the border between Yugoslavia, or SHS, Drzava Hrvato, Srbo Slovenco, and an armed fighting out. On the Austrian side, this fight was handed down in history under the name Kärntner Abwehrkampf, in English, Corinthian defense fight. On the Yugoslav side, now the Slovenian side, it was handed down in history as Boy za Severnomea, battle for the northern border. So already this shows us how this history was uh, handed down in different ways. The Council of the Allied Victory Powers of World War I finally ordered a democratic referendum in our region and a plebiscite could be held to decide which country will get Southern Corinthia. A voting zone was defined and you can see here the voting zone on the second picture. Um, you can see it on green where the first votes took place. The referendum took place on October the 10th in 1920 and almost 60% of the votes were in favor of remaining with Austria. It has to be pointed out, and this has not been done in our region for decades, that almost 70% of the voters, of the people, were Corinthian Slovenes, which means they were Slovenes speaking and, of course, said those Slovene speaking people, persons from most uh, Slovene speaking persons on the southern side of the border. Corinthian Slovene with, of course, the mother tongue Slovene. The language border ran right through the middle of Corinthia after the end of First World War. You can imagine on the second picture here, on the southern part, uh, mainly Slovene speaking. This means, as a matter of fact, around half of the pro-Austrian votes in the 1920 referendum came from Corinthian Slovenes. They opted against a national solution, which would be, of course, the vote for Yugoslavia or SHS. Many of them would rather live in a democratic republic with social legislation than in a monarchy. In addition, for many people, economic motives were the reason. And, of course, Slovenes were already reigned by Austro-Hungarian Empire before, which might have also had an important effect for the votes. The promises of the political leadership of Corinthia, German leadership, that the national and linguistic identity of Corinthian Slovenes would be fully respected after the referendum soon turned out to be a lie. Measures for Germanization began to take effect, bilingual name signs of places disappeared, for example, and Slovene as a second official language was abolished. Around 2,000, maybe 3,000 Slovenes had to leave the region shortly after the referendum, and this is also not handed down in the cultural memory of our region. I have to switch to the second slide. It will work right now. Yes. This is the slide which I wanted. So under National Socialism, the situation came to a dramatic peak. Corinthia was to become the ideal image of Germanic borderland, a bulwark against enemy of Slavs. Corinthian Slovenes were pushed to absolute Germanization. The Slovene language and culture was to disappear completely. 
leaders of the Slovenian ethnic group and people who resisted were deported to consecration camps, camps and families were forcibly resettled in forced labor camps. From our region, Southern Carinthia, almost 1,000 persons had to leave, of course, babies, children, as well as older people, in whole Slovene-speaking area, also on the other side of um, the Austrian border, in then Yugoslavia, which was taken over from the Nazis, almost 18,000 people were deported. <clears throat> A lot of people lost their lives, lives, and of course, many more had to deny their Slovene roots and had the chance or opportunity, speaking dramat uh, dramatically, they had to deny their roots, of course. The reason why we briefly discuss these historical events is that this conflict ridden past forms the basis for our research project here in the border region between Austria and Slovenia, today's Slovenia. The propaganda surrounding the referendum of 1920, you can see picture from the propaganda back in these times, later under national socialism, but also in decades after that, when Slovenes speaking Corinthia were repeatedly harassed, has left its mark in our region, even among the younger generations. Prejudices were passed on wordlessly on both sides of the border. Regarding the events surrounding the referendum and the demarcation of the 1920, the transition from communicative to cultural memory has already been completed. There are, of course, no more contemporary witnesses. Currently, we have to deal with the situation on the question of how pupils can still access these historical events today and which, past, which parts of the history are useful for dealing with questions relevant to the future. Today's students often have no personal access to this history through their family biography. And nevertheless, the hostile traditional historical narratives that are always present in society influence their attitudes. Our research project was born out of this knowledge, namely with the aim of finding ways to strengthen new, more inclusive historical narratives that connect people and regions. This year's 100th anniversary of the referendum and border demarcation affects not only Carinthia, but also today Slovenia. The dis decision of then affected both countries while Austria was able to keep territory, Slovenia lost, of course, territory. And this was, of course, in a lot of regions after World War I. In the last century, the border area was marked by separation, prejudices and ignorance towards the neighbors. This was the occasion for our project. To deal with the history of the border area in school, which is currently affected, affected and narratives interwoven with it. We developed a concept for the collaborative treatment of the topic by scholars, teachers and students. In Austria in the last century, victims of national socialism, fascism, had little space in public memory, if not even they had any space. In the past years, researchers noticed a discourse change and nowadays even more and more Austrian teachers are willing to deal with regional manifestations of national socialism, including topics such as collective guilt and the collaboration of Corinthians with national socialism, which of course was big. Regional anecdotes seem to be of interest for contemporary pupils. What is commonly named a culture of memory is thus a dynamic field of negotiation of conflicts, an unfinished process of debate on what a group should call its history. These processes of a social ne negotiation for memory are particularly interesting in both regions. Pass now on to my colleague Nadia. Yes, thank you very much, Daniel. Um, I will give you now more detailed information about our project. Um, the project was accomplished in cooperation of the Educational University. Carinthia and the University of Klagenfurt. Daniel um, works at the Educational University and I'm working at the University of Carinthia in Klagenfurt. Um, the project started with a teacher's workshops. Teachers from both sides of the border, from Carinthia and from Slovenia, uh, were invited to a two-day advanced training seminar on historical narratives in the border region. 
this took place in spring 2019. In this workshop, they exchanged their views on whether and how the history of the border is dealt with in their lesson. The teachers reported on their experiences with historical political education in their schools and which historical narratives they are familiar with around the border. They also discussed um, which regional remembrance signs of events of the last hundred years are most strongly perceived in their region and which ones are marginalized. This group of Austrian and Slovenian teachers was suggested to carry out a project for one year of lessons um, with a class on the topic remembrance culture in the border region at their schools. In the following school year, this was the school year 2019-2020. The focus of this project should be on historically relevant events of the last hundred years. The concrete topics and contents were left to the teachers themselves. Our project teams, the scientific team, supported them in the concept, in the conception and also in the implementation of the projects. The individual school projects took place at schools in Carinthia and Slovenia, and they had different focuses. In some cases, they focused on regional places of remembrance and the historical events associated with them, while others were dedicated to concrete biographies or the family history of individual pupils. The thematic focus varied from workshops on democracy awareness to excursions on the Jewish history of the region. Pupils worked on the official and on the, on the less visible historical narratives in their surroundings. They reflected their own family history in the context of borders. They explored their region and the documented signs of remembrance. In the course of the project, the pupils were brought into conversation about the extent to which historical events on this and on the other side of the border were or still are evaluated differently. And they reflected on the influences that determine the development of remembrance culture. In the individual school projects, a multi-perspective approach to history was pursued. And it was made clear that multilingualism has a tradition in this region. In addition, different perspectives of the older generations on the historical events on both sides of the border were worked on and jointly considered what makes it so difficult to overcome attitudes and prejudices. All against the background of the anniversaries 2020, which were or which are, we still are in 2020, these anniversaries are 100 years of the referendum in Carinthia, the referendum Daniel talked about, 1920, and uh, 75 years of liberation from National Socialism. Um, based on experiences in the individual school projects, concrete didactic tips and examples of work assignments were developed in cooperation between teachers and scientists. And they can be used by teachers from different schools in the region, but also beyond the region. The region-specific project activities of the individual partner schools were evaluated for this purpose. The practical suitability of the newly developed didactic su suggestions was checked in our team and criticism and suggestions for change were incorporated by the teachers. These didactic suggestions and teaching materials can be found together with the project results in a publication. This was presented on October the 9th, 2020, the day before the 100th anniversary of the referendum at the University of Education in Carinthia. The whole book is bilingual, German and Slovenian, and it is available in print and also open access. The newly developed didactic materials enable a multi-perspective view of regional events in both countries. They also contain good practice examples of school projects from recent years. 
this show concretely how lessons about the recent history of the border region can be taught in an inclusive and cross-border way. They can be used in particular to design commemorative days, but also be applied in regular lessons. In summary, we would like to describe the I would like to describe the quintessence of the project once again. It explored the question of how cross-border, more inclusive remembrance can be made possible in the border area between Austria and Slovenia, to which all inhabitants of that area can connect. In school projects in Austrian and Slovenian schools, the historical narratives on both sides of the border were examined for similarities and also for uh, differences. The goal was to filter out which narratives can have an inclusive and connective effect and how also people who have no family roots in this region can connect to these narratives. Through the exchange between teachers, students and researchers in several workshops, didactic materials with a long term benefit for the region were created. The focus is on suggestions how the history of the border region and its inhabitants can be communicated in an appealing way in the classroom, taking into account the diversity of the students. You have now already seen several impressions from the school projects. I would like to show you two more examples. A school from Klagenfurt carried out an excursion to the Auschwitz Memorial and the students documented this excursion photographically. Daniel, that's the wrong slide. No, yes, this one, that's the right one. Um, you can see here the pupils in front of the of photos they took in Auschwitz. Uh, they used the photos to design an exhibition at the school in Klagenfurt and organized an exhibition opening. Students acted as guides through the exhibition and the exhibition was open to the public. At another school, several round table events were organized in a cultural center where students exchanged ideas with contemporary witnesses and experts about how to deal with history and where the general public could also participate. You can hear, you can see here, uh, Daniel, please go back. You can see here the uh, specially made round table. It was made for um, events like this, bringing a lot of people together on this special table to discuss um, different topics. And this was a transgenerational event um, with uh, eyewitnesses of national socialism, experts, teachers, and also pupils from schools uh, discussing at the table. And this event was also open to the public. As a result of our project, a practical pedagogical science to practice book in both Slovene and German was published. You can see the book here now. Um, it was published also open access to reach as much teachers and people on both sides of the uh, today's border. With all these individual, more concrete insights into the contents of the school projects, we would like to close our short presentation and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for this presentation. I think it is very, very important to learn about how to implement educational, cross-cultural, cross-border uh, project. And uh, now we uh, go back a little bit in time uh, to the reception of Rau Wallenberg. Uh, this presentation will be held by Ida Richter. Hello Ida and welcome here. Mm -hmm. uh, just let me introduce you shortly. Ida Richter, she is a PhD candidate of the Selma Stern Center for Jewish Studies Berlin-Brandenburg at the Center for Research on Antisemitism at Technica University Berlin. She studied political science at the French-German campus of Sciences Po Paris in Nancy and at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and completed her MA degree in human rights at uh, Sciences Po Paris. Since October uh, 
2018, Ida has been working on her PhD dissertation under the working title Holocaust Memory and Human Rights Discourse, the case of Raoul Wallenberg, in the framework of a research group on the reception history of Yad Vashem's writers among the nations at the Selma Stern Center. The title of uh, Ida's presentation is The Entanglement of the Holocaust with Human Rights, the case of Raoul Wallenberg's early reception. Ida, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, first of all, I would warmly uh, thank the organizers for making this conference possible and for giving me this opportunity to present my research at a very early stage of my PhD project. So I'm very much looking forward to receive feedback from this group of experts gathered here online. So I'll jump right in. Since 2012, the Council of Europe, one of the main institutions in the field of the promotion of human rights in the European context, awards the Raoul Wallenberg Prize to individuals or organizations for outstanding achievements in humanitarian work and in the defense and promotion of human rights. On the slide, you can also see the logos of the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights, a Canadian human rights NGO, and the Raoul Wallenberg Institute of Human Rights and Humanitarian Law at Lund University, Sweden, which shows Wallenberg as a flagship for their institutions. These examples illustrate that Wallenberg, who is today one of the most well-known so-called rescuers of Jews during the Holocaust, is today easily associated with human rights as well as with other concepts such as humanitarianism, cosmopolitanism, or universalism. These are large and intertwined concepts, often used synonymously, which play a big role in the research on Holocaust memory in general, and the memory of rescue during the Holocaust specifically. In my PhD project that I carry out in the framework of a research group on Yad Vashem's Righteous Among the Nations at the Zema Stern Center for Jewish Studies, I am focusing on the historical connection between human rights and Holocaust memory by taking the example of Wallenberg's reception history since 1945. Whereas it is common today to see Wallenberg's connection to human rights as self-evident or somewhat natural, I am showing in my PhD project that it developed in specific contexts and served specific purposes. By inquiring about the genesis of this connection, broader topics can be addressed, such as the emergence of the intersection between Holocaust memory and human rights, the universalization of Holocaust memory, as well as different uses of the topic of rescue and help during the Holocaust. Today, I will present some of my results concerning the period of Wallenberg's immediate post-war reception. I will address the question as to how far Raoul Wallenberg's mission in Budapest was already then placed in the context of the defense of human rights and whether Wallenberg was connected to other universalizing concepts, such as humanitarianism. Firstly, I will summarize the state of research on the historical development of the connection between Holocaust memory and human rights, as well as the relationship between the concepts human rights and humanitarianism. The second section will deal with Wallenberg's mission in 1944 in 1944, and in which terms it was framed already then. In the third part, I will analyze Wallenberg's depiction in universalizing terms in the two first biographies, published in the late 1940s. Finally, I will conclude by summarizing my results. Conventionally, it is assumed that memories of the Holocaust and the development of human rights regimes after 1945 were closely connected from the outset, as it is stated, for instance, by the sociologists Daniel Levy, Levy and Nathan Snyder, who presented the first comprehensive study on the potentially global nation state transcending dimensions of Holocaust memory, or by the political scientist Johannes Morsink. Recently, however, historians of human rights, such as Samuel Moyne or Marco Duranti, began questioning the assumption that the strong link between Holocaust memory and human rights discourse already emerged soon after the Second World War. Duranti showed that the genocide of the European Jews 
was not mentioned explicitly in the process of drafting and adopting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. Moyn lo located the beginning of the so-called human rights revolution, as well as the emergence of the connection between Holocaust memory and human rights, only decades um, after the end of the Second World War, namely in the 1970s. The case of Raoul Wallenberg, today a central figure in Holocaust memory associated with human rights and whose transnational reception history started directly from 1945 on, lends itself especially well to studying the question as to how far memories of the recent genocide of the European Jews and human rights discourse intersected directly after 1945. As it will emerge from my analysis that the concept of humanitarianism plays a prominent role in the process, I will now give a short and simplified overview about commonalities and differences between the notions of human rights and humanitarianism. Of course, neither of these concepts has an essential nature, but both are social constructs filled with different meanings in different historical contexts. Moreover, the relationship between human rights and humanitarianism both conceptually as well as, as historically, is complex and a topic of debate. However, in order to make clear in which contexts Wallenberg was or was not placed in the 1940s, discerning between both notions will be analytically helpful. As the political scientist Michael Barnett has point, pointed out, humanitarianism and human rights share some elements, such as a discourse of universal humanity and cosmopolitanism. However, he emphasized that their internal narratives and principles diverge significantly. In this table, I summarized some of these divergences. The discourse of human rights generally focuses on the legal realm, occupying itself with the formulation, encoding and enforcement of inherent rights of every human being, which are above the law of nation states and can be asserted against the state. Humanitarianism, on the other hand, concerns itself traditionally with protecting human lives in emergency situations, such as wars or natural disasters. This notion of extending help to people in need entails an element of paternalism, whereas human rights discourse is usually egalitarian. Also, whereas humanitarian action focuses on the immediate relief of suffering, human rights agendas address topics such as root causes and justice. I would now like to give a short overview of Wallenberg's biography and his mission in Budapest. We will see that it was not framed in rights terms while it was carried out, but that, interestingly enough, Wallenberg himself, as well as his employers, understood Wallenberg's activities as humanitarian action. Raoul Wallenberg was born in Stockholm in 1912 and grew up as a member of one of the most influential families in Sweden. After studying architecture in the United States, his further education in commerce and banking brought him to South Africa and even mandatory Palestine. Back in Stockholm, Wallenberg joined the food trading company of Kalman Lauer, a Jewish immigrant from Hungary. In July 1944, Wallenberg agreed to be sent to Hungary as a Swedish diplomat to try and improve the situation for the remaining 200,000 Jews in Budapest. The majority of Jews living in the rest of the country had been deported and murdered in the short period between Nazi Germany's occupation of its ally Hungary in March 1944 and the halting of the deportations in July 1944. Wallenberg's mission was supported by the War Refugee Board of the US American government, the World Jewish Congress, and the Jewish Joint Distribution Committee. From mid-October 1944 on, after the Hungarian fascist Eurocross party had gained power, Wallenberg's rescue activities gained intensity, most of them in coordination with the other neutral legations. These consisted, among other things, of issuing so-called protective passports, establishing safe houses under the Swedish flag, and negotiating with the Hungarian authorities. After the liberation of Budapest by the Red Army in January 1944, 1945, uh, Wallenberg disappeared in the Soviet Union, his fate remaining unresolved until today. It seems that neither Wallenberg himself 
nor the Swedish Foreign Ministry or other bodies involved, such as the War Refugee Board, have framed Wallenberg's activities in terms of human rights. However, Wallenberg's mission stood in the context of an explicit and declared adherence to policies guided by the principles of humanitarianism. In various reports and letters, Wallenberg himself referred to his activities as humanitarian action and even placed them within the context of Swedish humanitarian policies during the First World War. These had included exchanges of prisoners of war on Swedish ground and help extended to prisoners of war in Siberia by the Swedish Red Cross. According to the historian Lina Stofeld, the First World War thus had given Scandinavian countries, quote, new roles in the international arena as civilized role models and humanitarian great powers, end quote. Concerning the Second World War, a shift in Swedish foreign policy away from concessions to Nazi Germany and towards engaging in international humanitarian endeavors occurred in the middle of 1943. These involved Sweden's support in supplying the starving Greek population with foodstuffs, as well as active engagement in helping Jews threatened by the Holocaust, which had the effect of winning some recognition of the Allies. It is thus not surprising that explicit references to humanitarianism appear frequently in contemporary reports, telegrams and letters about Wallenberg's activities in Budapest. In short, Wallenberg's mission seems not to have been framed in human rights terms contemporarily, but it was clearly set in the context of humanitarianism. Wallenberg's depiction in the two earliest biographies, which were both published already in the 1940s, shows a similar pattern. The first biography of Raoul Wallenberg was authored by the Austrian Jewish journalist and writer Rudolf Philipp, who had emigrated to Sweden in 1937. After 1945, Philipp was in close contact with Raoul Wallenberg's immediate family, who was desperate to find out about his fate. At that time, the official Soviet version was that there was no, no Raoul Wallenberg in the Soviet Union and that he must have been killed in the fights around Budapest in early 1945, a version that was accepted by the Swedish government. Wallenberg's family, however, with the support of Philip, collected evidence that Raoul had been imprisoned in Moscow and was possibly still alive. Philip's book thus served the purpose of working towards his release by raising awareness to the Wallenberg case. Already in 1946, Philip's book, Raoul Wallenberg, Diplomat, Fighter Samaritan, appeared in Sweden, followed by a second book, Raoul Wallenberg, Fighter for Humanity, which appeared in Swedish and English in 1947 and serves as the basis of my analysis. Rudolf Philipp's description of Wallenberg and his motivations show the absence of any reference to human rights or offers on rights in general. However, other universalistic discourses can be found in abundance. For instance, he described Wallenberg as the humanitarian hero of World War II and emphasized that in spite of his loyalty to his country, he was above all a champion of humanity. Philip thus implied that Wallenberg's motivations had transcended the attachment to one nation that he rather served the universal cause of defending humanity than narrower national interests. Finally, Philip stated in his 1947 biography that Wallenberg's education in the United States, South Africa and mandatory Palestine had made of him a true cosmopolitan with a deep knowledge of different countries, unaffected by national prejudices. Thus, Philip repeatedly used the universalistic language of humanity cosmopolitanism and humanitarianism to characterize Wallenberg's motivations and actions. In 1948, another biography on Raoul Wallenberg was published, first in Hungarian and soon after also in Swedish, which was written by the Hungarian Jewish historian and journalist Jenő Levi. As the historian Ferenc Lazzo has pointed out, Levi's many publications on the Holocaust in Hungary in the second half of the 1940s provide another refutation of the so-called myth of silence, according to which the genocide of the European Jews was only publicly discussed and researched decades after 1945. 
Levi's book on Raoul Wallenberg, which is based on a variety of documentary sources and accounts of survivors, had been commissioned by the Raoul Wallenberg Committee in Budapest, which had formed soon after the war and consisted of former holders of protective passports and Jewish employees of Wallenberg's team at the Swedish Embassy. The committee had also collected funds to erect a statue honoring Wallenberg and named a street in Budapest after him, both already in 1945. Similarly to Rudolf Philipp, Levi did not frame Wallenberg in terms of human rights, but used the universalistic language of humanity at numerous occasions and firmly characterized Wallenberg's deeds as inspired by humanitarianism. Specifically, Levi put great emphasis on the parallels that he perceived between Wallenberg and the Swedish Red Cross delegate Elsa Brenström, who became famous for her help to prisoners of war in Siberia during the First World War. By the way, Wallenberg himself had mentioned Brenström in memorandum to the Hungarian Foreign Ministry, which Levi also cited in his book. In fact, Levi had authored a book about Brenström, as he explained in the foreword. This is the second time within 25 years that I find myself charged with the task of writing about Swedish national heroes, or rather heroes of humanity who happen to be Swedish, and express my own gratitude and that of many thousands of people who were persecuted, victimized and saved from certain death by the Swedish heroes. After the First World War, one of my books was dedicated to Elsa Brenström, so that on behalf of tens of thousands of Hungarian prisoners of war, we could express our thanks and recall her wonderful humanitarian deeds. There is no doubt that members of the younger generation of Swedes, including Raoul Wallenberg, were inspired by her wonderful example to stand by those who were persecuted. The first aspect that I would like to emphasize is that by capturing both under the notion of humanitarian aid, Levi linked Brenström's help for Hungarian prisoners of war with Wallenberg's aid to Hungarian Jews threatened by the Nazi genocide. Also, both groups were generalized under the notion of people who were persecuted, victimized and saved from certain death. The specificity of Nazi persecution and murder of the European Jews thus fades into the background. It should be noted, however, that this universalizing tendency is not present throughout the rest of the book. Secondly, by labeling Wallenberg and Brenström as heroes of humanity who happen to be Swedish, Levi implied in his 1948 biography that their deeds transcended their national belonging by being relevant for all of humanity, an aspect that I have also highlighted with regards to Philip's framing of Wallenberg. However, it has to be noted that Levi still emphasized that both his humanitarian heroes were Swedish national heroes as well. This leads me to conclude that Raoul Wallenberg seems not to have been framed in human rights terms in the 1940s, neither contemporarily nor by his two first biographers. Whereas human rights talk was absent, the notion of humanitarianism, however, appeared frequently. The languages of human rights and humanitarianism do share some elements, such as a discourse of universalism, humanity and cosmopolitanism. However, even though these elements were present when, when Wallenberg himself described his activities as humanitarian action or in Wallenberg's early reception as a humanitarian hero, this does not suffice to qualify as an early version of Wallenberg's depiction as a human rights defender. The example of Raoul Wallenberg thus supports the claim by historians such as Duranti and Moyn that framing the Nazi genocide of the European Jews as an as an extreme case of violations of human rights was not yet common at the time right after 1945. The case of Raoul Wallenberg shows, however, again, that framing the topics in terms of humanitarianism was common already during the war and, and in its immediate aftermath, which might, point, which might point to a special role of the topic of rescue in that regard. Indeed, both Wallenberg's first biographers who were writing from very different contexts, chose to characterize Wallenberg in terms of humanitarianism. <clears throat> Considering the similarities between the discourses of humanitarianism and human rights, Wallenberg's framing as a humanitarian in his early post-war reception 
can thus in some ways be seen as a foundation for him later becoming a symbol for human rights. However, that this eventually happened was by no means a necessary and self-evident consequence, but will have to be explained by the evolution of his further reception history. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very Thank much you for very this much. presentation in which you dis deconstructed the entanglement of uh, Raoul Wallenberg with uh, human rights. I think it's uh, by revisiting uh, his early reception. And uh, now this is time to reflect all of, all of this presentation we heard today. And we have a special guest who also in a large extent uh, contributed uh, to the organizing of this, uh, of this conference, uh, Zofia Wojcicka um, <coughs> from the German Historical Institute of Warsaw. She studied history and sociology at the University of Warsaw, the Friedrich Schiller University Jena and the School for Social Research of the Polish Academy of Sciences. Dr. Wojcicka has worked as an educator at Polin Museum of the History of Polish Jews Warsaw and as an exhibi exhibition curator at the House of European History Brussels. She was a researcher at the Center for Historical Research Berlin of the Polish <coughs> Academy of Sciences. Currently, she is working on a project titled The Rescue of Jews During the Second World War in the Narratives of European Museums and her publications include Arrested Morning, Memory of the Nazi Camps in Poland, 1944-1915. Welcome, Zofia, uh, and I kindly invite you to comment on all of the presentation we heard today, and you have more or less 15 minutes to do that. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, inviting me to comment on this uh, very interesting panels. Um, we had four uh, very interesting presentations, but I must say they were very different. Uh, so we had two presentations by Ida Richter and Naum Trajanowski on um, what one could call the history of memory of, of, of the Holocaust. Uh, in northern Macedonia during the communist times and after the breakup of Yugoslavia. Uh, uh, and, in the, um, and also about the memory of the Holocaust in the direct post-war years on the example of Raoul Wallenberg. And in this case, one could even speak about a sort of uh, memory transcending national borders and even the Cold War divide. Then we had a presentation by Nadia Dangelmeyer and Daniel Wuti, which had a sort of more pract was practical based and about developing educational projects and materials for teaching about conflict ridden history of the 20th century on the Austro Slovenian uh, border. And last but not least, we had the presentation on Anna Hebotarova, and she presented a text on sociological research on the relation between knowledge about and memory of the Holocaust and the level of anti-Semitism in uh, Ukraine. And what I also found very find, found very interesting this. Uh, regional and social differentiation of those uh, memories uh, in Ukraine. So both in terms of themes and um, methodological approach, we had in fact four very different presentations. And uh, I must say it was quite hard for me when I read them all um, in the last days to kind of find a sort of common denominator for all of them. But I will take up the challenge, and uh, you will have to judge if I succeeded. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so uh, I will first give some uh, very general re remarks, and then I will have some questions to, to actually each of the presenters. Uh, so I think one, one, only one possible denominator for those, common denominator for those uh, four presentations would be the relation between um, 
the global and the transnational uh, the, or sorry, the global or the transnational and the national or better to say local. Or at least I think that those four papers could be a starting point for a discussion on, on, on such issues. Uh, at the beginning of, uh, of, of this millennium, Nathan Schneider and Daniel Levy, who will be also a keynote speaker at one of, um, of the conference sessions, uh, announced the emergence of what they called a cosmopolitan memory of the Holocaust. Uh, a cosmopolitan memory, uh, so they claimed, was driven, and this was already mentioned by Ida Richter, uh, by Ida Richter, by the development of the human rights discourse and the growing tendency towards universalizing history. Instead of, I quote, looking towards the past to produce a new formative myth, Holocaust memory should or becomes, so they claimed, more future oriented. So in consequence, the past is increasingly understood as a reservoir of role models, so to say. It's not so much about understanding what happened in the past, but using history for uh, learning how to deal with what will come with the future. <clears throat> Um, although uh, this was maybe not explicitly formulated, uh, the text um, by Levy and Schneider, more prog programmatic than analytical, I would claim, propounded the development of a common mnemoscape, as Astrid Erl would say, a global or at least Euro-Atlantic unified narrative on World War II and uh, the Holocaust. Uh, however, soon uh, it turned out that this concept of cosmopolitan memory does not work fully as assumed. One can speak about an international proliferation of certain topics, motives, um, and forms of presenting uh, uh, and commemorating uh, history. And this is uh, in particular visible in memorial museums. In this context, Sabina Tanovic um, even writes about the emergence of a sort of physical mnemonic system, a global theater of memory, enhanced by the growing global social network and ready availability of knowledge and information conditioned uh, uh, by the internet. And I would add to other factors, um, the mass media and the role of transnational institutions such as, for example, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance in propagating a certain sort of visions of, of, of history. But in fact, this process proves quite superficial. Rather than the globalization, uh, we witness a, what um, Sharon MacDonald called glocalization of European Holocaust memory. Thus, a local reframing of global patterns, their appropriation and adaptation, and often also distortion to suit a very particular national, but not only national needs. And so this concept of uh, cosmopolitan memory was uh, sort of evolved. And uh, 2011, Daniel Levy, together with Lars Breuer and Michael Heinlein published an article on reflexive particularism, as they call it. Uh, this was an article based on focus group research in Germany, Austria, and Poland. And they came to the conclusion that the cosmopolitanization uh, of memory is not um, about emergence of a unified historical narrative, but about growing awareness and acknowledgement, which I think is already very optimistic in a way to say that, of, of the existence of different, often conflicting memory cultures and views on the past. And in this context, Alei Dasman also came up with the idea of a dialogic remembrance. And my colleagues from the Horizon 2020 project, Unsettled Remembrance in Transnational Europe, Anna Sento-Bull and Hans Hansen Lauge developed the concept of agonistic memory as an alternative to both antagonistic, but also cosmopolitan memory. And um, agonistic memory would, so uh, they, <clears throat> they formulated it, would allow to expose, discuss, and problematize different, often conflicting ways 
of looking at history. This is easy to say, but quite hard to implement. But there are attempts to work with those concepts. For example, there is an Israeli-Palestinian history textbook presenting consequently two different interpretations of history, one from the Jewish and the other from the Palestinian perspective. And there are also many other interesting projects in terms of uh, historical education museums which try to work with this concept of, of, of well, agonism or, or a sort of dialogic remembrance. Therefore, my very general question to all the authors uh, would be how uh, this interrelation between the sort of global and international and the local national uh, is visible in your case studies. Um, but I have also very specific questions um, to, uh, to, 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 to the presenters, which sort of maybe connect partly to this. And, and, and the first question would be to Ida Richter. Um, first, um, one question which actually appeared when, when you talked. I was wondering, because in a way you formulated this um, presentation in, uh, in dialogue or in, um, with, with Daniel Levy and, and Nathan Schneider, as I understood, and you say it's not true that the Holocaust memory is from the start on connected to the uh, human rights discourse. I must say I read uh, Nathan Schneider's and Levy's book some time ago, so maybe I don't remember exactly, but from wh what I understood is that they sort of claim that in fact this race of Holocaust memory is actually the, the start is somewhere in the 80s, 90s. So before, of course, you had some discussions, books and so on, but this sort of global or at least the spread of Holocaust memory and universalization came up only in the 90s. And this they sort of connect to this human rights discourse. So in a way, what you say wouldn't be in, in, wouldn't be contradictory to what they claim, if I understand well. And what would be also interesting for me um, is um, uh, how, how, how was the, if you know how this figure of Wallenberg, because you showed that he was sort of remembered from the very first years after the war, both on the sort of, in uh, both sides of the Iron Curtain, yes, in, in Hungary and in Sweden or Israel. And my question would be, was the figure of Wallenberg somewhere played out during the Cold War? Because it uh, occurred to me that this book by uh, Levi was published 48. Only one year later, we have the Laszlo Reich trial, which I'm not sure, but I think he had some connections to Wallenberg. And there is also the anti-Semitic aspect or overtone of the of the of the Laszlo uh, Laszlo Reich trial. So. As an example, was was the Wallenberg figure somehow played out during the Cold War between the two sides? My uh, question to Daniel Levy and Nadia Dangelmeyer would be: um, Could you, um, because at some point uh, you say that uh, the goal of sort of your were project was to filter out which narratives can have an, an inclusive and connecting effect on on on, on the people participating in those educational projects. And I, I wanted to ask once again, what you mean by that? Does it mean that you wanted to filter out only those sort of stories which are in a way, well, inclusive and um, uh, uh, well, easy to digest for both sides or, um, or, or so, so only consensual narratives? Or did you also search for conflicting narratives and on difficult issues and, um, and, and, and how to deal with them in, uh, in teaching history? Uh, this would be interesting for me to, to hear some examples of that because this may be more challenging, but also maybe um, no less fruitful than looking for the consensual. Um, to Anna Hebatorova, uh, I, I um, have, uh, well, actually, one remark which occurred to me. I thought maybe your, it would be interesting to compare your uh, research with, with 
maybe some other countries and there is lots of bit similar research in, in the methodology on Poland by Piotr Kwiat, uh, Kwiatkowski and also by Bilevich, by Pentor and Cebos. They made um, quite a lot of research on the memory of World War II and specifically also the Holocaust in Poland. So maybe this could be interesting to, for you to compare. Uh, but um, most important, uh, you gave us sort of a snapshot of the state of art in the years and just to 2013-17. I understood this was the time when this research was uh, made. But could you tell us about a bit more about sort of long term term processes? Is there a sort of evolution of this memory in Ukraine? Mm. I know there are some projects to commemorate the Holocaust, for example, in Ukraine, the Lviv Ghetto or the Holocaust Museum in Dnipro. Are those only sort of marginal projects or can they be considered as, uh, well, trendsetters in a way? Uh, and uh, I had another question, but maybe this I will leave for later. And the last question would be for uh, Naum Trajanowski. First, also a remark. I don't know if you know the book by Tomasz Szukowski, Wielki Retusz, um, which was published, I don't know, one or two years ago. It's also about films in, um, in Polish films which deal with the topic Holocaust, but his thesis is a bit different from yours because he would say that the films, uh, though made in communist Poland, they are not always an expression of the sort of official communist policy of history. But if they look at them in detail, they are sometimes subversive and saying things which uh, you would not say officially. And maybe they were sometimes even not really read as such because people didn't want to know. For example, there is the um, film which is called Naganiacz, which is actually about Poli Poles participating in the Holocaust. Um, and it was made in the 60s. So, uh, so one question which appeared to me is, is it really true that in the Macedonian case, the films can be um, uh, treated sort of only as an expression of the official memory? Or maybe if you read them properly, maybe they are also in some ways subversive and um, uh, not sort of on one line with the official policy. And then I would also like to know about more about this um, uh, a, a sort of a, the role of the Holocaust memory in uh, the relations between Northern Macedonia, Bulgaria, and the EU and the European Union. You mentioned already the the sort of uh, conflict between Northern Macedonia and Bulgaria on, uh, about the film Third Half. Could you <clears throat> say a bit more how um, how maybe um, this triangle? Uh, influences the narratives, the Holocaust narratives in Macedonia. And uh, I have quite some other questions, but I will leave that for later. Thank you very much for the very interesting uh, presentations. Thank you very much for your commentary. And now I would like to give the voice to our presenters. I think <coughs> that the best would be to make it in the inverse order you presented your papers. So first I would like to ask Ida, then Nadia, then Anna, and at the end Naum to answer the questions. So first Ida Richter. Thank you very much, first of all, for these comments. They were absolutely great. Um, so to your first question on uh, Levi, Levi and Snyder's book, um, of course, it's a, it's a central book that I engage with in my PhD project. And I think you're absolutely right when you say that, that, they, um, that they said that the 1990s were a crucial, um, a crucial turning point <coughs> for the so-called universalization of Holocaust memory or cosmopolitanization. Um, I think they do say in their parts on the time after 1945 that um, the Holocaust drove um, 
grow of the development of human rights to a certain extent, which also um, corresponds to, to contemporary research. Um, but um, my point, I think, is um, I, I think, yes, I, I don't completely disagree with, uh, with what Levy and Snyder wrote. Um, but maybe um, the case of Wallenberg um, uh, lends itself especially well to complexify the, the narrative a bit. And um, because I found that actually um, the timeline is, is a bit more complicated maybe than, um, than how it looks in their very general description uh, concerning the case of Raul Weinberg, of course. Um, which means that I found already that much before the 1990s, there is a lot of universalizing discourse on Raul Weinberg. So as we saw in, in the books that I presented in the presentation, um, that there was um, talk about humanitarianism, a discourse of humanity, um, already starting from 1945 on, basically. So in this sense, I'm, I'm kind of maybe nuancing um, this notion that only in the 1990s it really started to become this universalized memory. And at the same time, um, I try to kind of um, nuance between these different terms of human rights and universalized memory and it's kind of to disentangle them a bit. And I'm still... Um, um grappling with that topic and um and i'm still not not quite sure what what i will find for the case of Frau weinberg when when exactly it, it happened that he was connected to this human rights discourse um and um yes to your second question it's an excellent question because um i now presented really the first uh, yeah, the first um, few years after 1945, but I think, and, and that's why I didn't speak maybe about the Cold War a lot, but I have the impression already that the Cold War is, is one of the central contexts for the memory of Raul Weinberg. And um, yes, I'm, I'm still at the beginning of the project, but I can already see that um, we have on the US American side, for example, we have um, definitely um, this issue that that this figure of Raul Weinberg was played out in the in the Cold War context, and which was interestingly also connected to his attachment to human rights. So um, it seems to me from what I read up, up until now that um, from 1970, the late 1970s on, he was um, um, depicted as a victim of human rights violations by the Soviet Union. Um, so, so it kind of he he fits he fits very well into this um, Cold War um, Cold War discourse um, on the U.S. American side, and that's why he he was um, a central figure in U.S. American Holocaust memory also. Um, and there, there, there are lots, lots of more examples, but I will try to be short here to give the other um, presenters also some time to respond. Thank you very much. And now I would like to ask Nadia to answer the question. Nadia, are you here? Okay. We have information that uh, there is no Sorry. Nadia, yes, unfortunately. Yes, here. I'm here again. Can you hear you me? You are here again. Okay, so perfect. Yes. Yes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, yes. Um, the question was to what extent we filtered out narratives that have an inclusive effect. And I can say the following about this question. Our aim was to show the young people that history is always a construction as soon as the historical event is over and people are talking about it. And it was important.
important to us to show the different perspectives on the same historical event and to collect attempt, attempts to explain why a historical event is remembered differently by different people and by different groups. And in this way, the students dealt with narratives that were unfamiliar with them to that point, and they were trying to see things through the eyes of the other side of the board. microphone so now uh, I apologize for for this technical problem and I would like to ask in the meantime Anna Hebotarova to uh, answer the questions I hope her microphone works properly no Thank yes you. no yes okay yes 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 uh, I hear you good great Thank you very much for these uh, very important and uh, interesting questions. Uh, first of all, concerning the comparative framework, um, yes, I personally was very much inspired by the research which has been carried out in Poland by a number of institutions on both the questions of memory of World War II and uh, uh, anti-Semitic attitudes. And uh, particularly, I'd like to mention the volume that was published in, I think, 2004. And it was uh, Ireneusz Krzemiński and his team who actually conducted a comparative survey of the anti-Semitism anti in Poland and Ukraine. And I think maybe today it would be really fascinating to, to uh, kind of repeat such study and see how the situation has changed. And when it comes to the research of this question uh, by sociologists in Ukraine, uh, they are, well, rather limited. And usually the, the, the data from previous years that we get uh, uh, come from uh, big international research, like the one by uh, Anti-Defamation League, for example. Whereas uh, in Ukraine, the, the question that is monitored more often uh, is um, uh, anti-Semitic behavior, such as, for example, vandalism or uh, anti-Semitic violence, whereas uh, the attitudes uh, are not studied uh, on such a large scale, uh, which I think makes uh, our survey and our research also quite interesting in this case. Um, when it comes to the um, the tendencies in, in, in Holocaust memory in Ukraine in general, of course, it's a, it's a very big question that would probably require, I don't know, not even a conference presentation, but, uh, but a book. Uh, but if I would to emphasize some uh, critical tendencies, uh, I think that uh, what we saw in the 90s, in the one hand, the opening possibilities for commemorating uh, the Holocaust, and uh, we've, uh, we've seen a number of, of monuments and a number of commemorative ceremonies that have been happening. Actually, the, this, this uh, tendency began even in uh, the times of perestroika, so in late 80s, uh, and, and then con they continued into, into the 90s. But, uh, the, the problem of, of these tendencies is that the memory of the Holocaust be, became marginalized by being basically outsourced uh, and limited to mostly Jewish organizations and certain uh, non-government organizations that, that started to work with the uh, Holocaust education, such as the, uh, the centers in Kiev and in Dnipro, uh, whereas the, the level of, of state inclusion and, and local uh, authorities and uh, educational systems inclusion in these processes was very limited. Uh, I think it has changed a little bit in the in the recent years, uh, but uh, of course this, these questions are still very very complicated and very loaded with with, with uh, conflictual meanings. 
And this can be very brightly illustrated by the case of Bab and Yar commemoration. As you know, there have been several attempts to create a memorial museum in Kiev in one of the largest killing sites in Europe. However, uh, several of them failed for various reasons in previous years. And now there is a huge conflict around two projects. One uh, is uh, more like state supported, but, but criticized by many scholars. And another uh, is a very contemporary and very interesting project, but uh, there is a controversy around the, the figure of Ilya Shanovsky, the uh, Russian uh, film director and his activity, and also, also the fact that financial support for this project comes from uh, Russian oligarchs who are, uh, you know, Ukrainian Jews by origin. So, uh, in a way, it, there is a positive tendency of kind of resurfacing of Holocaust commemoration in the public sphere. Uh, but uh, I think it's a, it's a very long road. And uh, as I mentioned before, it's particularly complicated by the memory wars uh, exacerbated by uh, the current conflict. And to address briefly your question on the relation between global and local uh, narratives on Holocaust memory, uh, well, I think if, if it comes to Ukraine, uh, we definitely see the constant appeals to European memory frameworks uh, in the historical debates and in also different memorial projects. But what is interesting that in our survey, we've also explored the relations between Holocaust memory and uh, uh, European identity. And uh, in fact, we, we didn't see this connection. So I think that um, in, in, the, in, the, in the level of, of mass attitudes, this, this European framework of Holocaust memory doesn't really, um, uh, it is not really reflected. So it, 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 it remains mostly on the level of uh, uh, act, actors' uh, engagement and probably political debates around this memory. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I would like to ask Naum if he is there to answer the questions. Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Okay. Just briefly, maybe three three to four sentences. Thanks, Zofia, again, uh, uh, very much on the point. Uh, namely, practically three, three, three points. First one, I just want to restate the, the main point of the, of the paper and then try to, to answer the, the two questions directed to me so practically what happened in, in what what was the whole story about uh, there was the there was a juncture in the uh, in the history writing practically which i mapped uh, at the at the at the writings of the two jewish uh, authors uh, who practically reacted to this peak of the official memory production in the in the early uh, 80s what happened with the film industry uh, I hope it's fine with the with the with the sound. Uh, yes, what happened is. with the with the film industry in the same way as the as the museum uh, 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 sphere in 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 Macedonia was that they failed to recognize this this switch practically this uh, this juncture. The museum uh, the museal workers uh, in the in the late 90s and the early uh, 90s practically up up until the formation of the. Whole Memorial Center in Skopje went into redefining uh, uh, the Ottoman experience of coexistence uh, 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 with the Jews and the other uh, ethnicity at the Macedonian territories. So practically, without this this reference point of the of the brotherhood and, and unity, uh, official memory narrative. And on the other hand, that the film uh, the film kind of uh, industry. And here comes your. Uh, your 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 question very much on the point went into the direction of of this cosmopol cosmopolitan very main, mainstream mainstreamized memory of the uh, of the Holocaust as 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 recreated in in the third half. Here, of course, a lot of a lot of uh, uh, um, remarks can be mentioned. Namely, the director was living in Hollywood, and he in several regard uh, the film was very much promoted in the U.S. and uh, in several. Uh, occasions he also mentions certain certain American films uh, as as direct inspirations for for his movie. Uh, the second question uh, about the 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 kind of hidden agenda of the of the of the films, uh, if you know, of course I'm paraphrasing right now. 
Uh, well, yes and no. I, I believe with an additional research, and I plan to do so, uh, one can actually map this uh, this this kind of uh, small uh, twists which were performed in the Macedonian cinema uh, on the Holocaust. And here I would just give the the hint on the on the the, the famous uh, uh, Fritz Hans pistol, namely in the in the real life assassination. Which was depicted and recreated in the first movie. The pistol of of the of the of the uh, of Fritz Kant is not is not uh, shooting. While in the movie, it, it's it's actually shooting. So this, with probably with interviews uh, with the film crew, can be can be it will it will be actually quite interesting to see uh, how it 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 uh, it, it developed. Uh, on the other hand, there are some uh, TV projects uh, starting from from the late 50s even. Uh, up until the uh, up until up until nowadays, of course, but uh, mostly in the 70s, which are mostly again focused similarly to Matkovsky's agenda, to one one film director Dmitry Onsmanli, who was pr practically very much interested in the topic of the Holocaust. And here, of course, you can you can find different sort of references. Uh, as for the question of Bulgaria, EU, Macedonia, I believe I won't I won't be able to address it. Uh, in such a short period of time, so I believe we will have, and I hope we will have another occasion to, to discuss this uh, this issue. Thank you very much, Naum. Uh, I have no information whether the technical problem with Nadia became fixed or not. So now I would like to ask Zofia Vujicka if she would like to react on these answers. Uh, I, I think now maybe we leave the sort of time for people to other other participants to ask questions. Otherwise, I have no comments. I would have further questions. I am happy to ask, but maybe do you have any questions from the audience? It seems that we don't have any more questions from our audience, uh, which is probably uh, because of the reason everybody is already very tired. So I. I think just feel free to ask your further questions and make let's make another round and then conclude. Um, okay, so <clears throat> uh, uh, maybe just uh, I heard some strange sounds. Okay, maybe just um, understanding questions to now and sort of in reaction to what 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 you said now because you said the third half, which I didn't see, I must say, I even tried because I read, you know, I read your uh, previous articles already. I tried to see it, but it's uh, not so easy to, to get. But you said that it's sort of, a, you would say, a cosmopolitan uh, movie, because from what you described, I, I rather understood that the agenda is rather nationalistic in a way, that it's an agenda of showing the good Macedonians, who the helpers who help to whatever rescue Jews and the bad and the bad Bulgarians, which maybe would not fully fit into the cosmopolitan approach as Daniel Levy described. But this is just an understanding question. Uh, I would have one. I mean, it was very interesting what you said, Anna, uh, about about. Uh, about the changes in in, in Ukrainian uh, memory, and especially what you said that you ask about this question about feeling European and how this related to uh, to being uh, to, to the kind of memory of the Holocaust and anti-Semitism. Um, uh, I, uh, I I would have though another question because I, lately I read a very interesting article by. Uh, Jana Hendershmit, which who you may know, she wrote a biography of uh, Sheptitsky, and she wrote an article where she um, uh, where she shows that um, Sheptitsky in in the 90s and in, in the last years also was f foremost considered in Ukraine, in Western Ukraine, as a sort of national hero due to his sort of merits for the Ukrainian national cause. And that only um, uh, then sort of different, you could say, agents of memory started to underline his uh, his engagement in rescuing Jews, uh, sort of to get for him a recognition in Western Europe and European Union. So that in a way, uh, his being a 
whatever a righteous or a rescuer was in a way used as a trigger to to to, to kind of uh, allow him to enter the the, the European saloon and uh, so this was would be first my question if you would agree with such a thesis and and this would bring me again up to this question of the relations between um uh, between um, uh, uh, between Ukraine, but the, the sort of the role of the memory of of Holocaust in relations between Ukraine and 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 the European Union. Um, you mentioned that already, but maybe you could elaborate a bit more on this. Uh, and I think for the moment, this would be the most important issues, maybe. Thank you very much, Zofia. So now I would like to ask Naum uh, if he would like to react on what he heard from Zofia. Well, yes. Uh, yes, I agree. I mean, definitely. It's, um, you can hear me, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in a way, I mean, I was, I was, I, I was focused more uh, at the present point on the debates and mm -hmm. the reactions of the film. So practically I was trying to kind of uh, map these discursive shifts and then kind of discursive positionings uh, which the films actually provoked but a certain visual analysis would definitely reveal that uh, uh, the, the third half especially was very much uh, 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 relying on on the Schindler's list as such so for example uh, not not maybe in this very academic sense of the cosmopolitan memory but this very reference point of of what was uh, what uh, what the discussion was was built upon, so this this is more or less what uh, what I wanted to add, uh, and I believe uh, that that will be that will be it. I guess uh, if, if if something else uh, was, I mean, I, I hope it was it was clear enough. Mm -hmm. Yes, I I think yes. Uh, now Anna Habotarova. Um just a second uh, yes good uh, thank you very much for bringing up the the question of Sheptitsky. I think it's a fascinating case uh, to to study the uh, the formation of Holocaust memory in in Ukraine I didn't analyze uh, this question in particular but um, in a nutshell I would agree with this argument and I would rather speak as you know as a Lvivian myself uh, I do see the tendency of like two layers of memory uh, or about Sheptitsky. One is for internal consumption and another is more like packed for, uh, for external, for foreign relations. And uh, there has been a wave of commemorating Sheptitsky in public space. There is a big Sheptitsky scientific center. Uh, there is a, a monument which actually evoked a lot of controversies because of its design. But still, mm -hmm. and I think in all these discussions, what is usually emphasized is his role as a spiritual leader and is his role as a, uh, you know, as a Ukrainian nation builder in a sense. But very rarely you, you see the, uh, the appeals to, to this uh, history of rescue of Jews by, uh, by Sheptitsky and by other uh, Greek Catholic monks. And uh, I think this is quite interesting because when you come to the level of international discussions, then this is one of the, the most prominent seems that, that one uh, might uh, encounter. So uh, mm -hmm. I wouldn't you know, speculate too much uh, before doing some more substantial research on that, but this is at least uh, my feeling. And when it comes to the role of Holocaust memory in the relations with EU, I think that uh, it uh, usually comes uh, in many commemorative projects and in many discussions around them. And uh, I think that nowadays one of the biggest uh, obstacles in, in, in this um, I don't know, inclusion of Ukraine in, in, in more larger European uh, uh, memory framework and the processes that this might trigger in Ukraine is the fact that, uh, for example, uh, Ukraine is still not the member of Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. And I think that this process has been going for years and there has, have been various attempts to, to uh, join, to, to include Ukraine, but 
there always were uh, some internal political processes and problems that that prevented it and i think that this would be uh, definitely a very important step forward uh, to to kind of um, also um, inspire a, a larger societal debates and not only intellectual uh, intellectual conversations on this topic Thank you very much. And uh, now I'm asking Ida whether she would like to uh, react on, on, on anything, <clears throat> even if uh, there was no question addressed to her. Um, I don't think I have something specific to, to add. Um, I think um, that in spite of this diversity of um, presentations, I, I very much appreciate how we found uh, common topics, especially with the interplay between the global and the local, um, that we can discuss interdisciplinary. Um, yes, so that would be my, <laughs> my final contribution. Thank you very much. I think uh, your words uh, were a good end to, to, this, to this session because this is already quite late and uh, every one of us is exhausted. So uh, I would like to thank all of you uh, for the participation at this session. First uh, to our keynote speaker today, Eva Kovac, then our presenters, Naum Trajanovski, Daniel Vutti, Nadia Dangelmeyer, Anna Habotarova and Ida Richter and last but not least, Zofia Wojcicka to comment on uh, these presentations. So thank you very much again for your attention and let me kindly invite you to the next session, which will take place after tomorrow on 12 of November at the same time from 3 <coughs> o'clock p.m. And the title is overlooking the local dimensions of the Holocaust, language and cultural spatial politics of transmission. The session uh, is organized by the Jagiellonian University and our keynote speaker will be uh, on Thursday, Mindaugas Kwiatkauskas from Lithuania. Thank you very much again for your attention and see you on Thursday. <laughs>